So should I probably leave and rejoin? That may help, right? Hmm? That may help. Please. That might help actually. Participants, please wait for some time. Our speaker is joining soon. Yeah, so I rejoined. I probably need the permission again to share screen. Yes, sir. I give. Uh, I have already given you the permission. Can you please check? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, sir. Now it's yeah. visible. It should be. So, uh, Dr. Day, are you there? Shall we start? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so, respected uh, Dr. Momita Day, head of the department, physics department, Adamas University, our respected speaker, Dr. Koshik Roy, other professors, my fellow colleagues, all the students, and the other participants of this virtual meeting. A very good morning, everyone. As you are all aware, we have assembled here on the occasion of the Young Physicist Meet 2023, which is being organized by the Physics Department at Amato University. On behalf of the organizing committee, YPM, I welcome you all in this morning session of the second day of this meeting. Also, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the committee and personally to wish you all a very warm greetings. So let's begin the morning session. May I now request Dr. Mukherjee, Dr. Tamal Kumar Mukherjee to kindly chair the first session. Dr. Tamal Kumar Mukherjee has joined the Department of Physics in 2018, and he is the associate professor in this department. His current field of research is high energy physics. Dr. Mukherjee, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Vartacharya. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, a very good morning. Uh, very good. Good morning to you all. Uh, so we have uh, one, only one speaker in this session, and uh, uh, he's uh, uh, Dr. Koshi Roy from uh, Indian Association of, Association for Cultivation of Science. Uh, Dr. Roy uh, did his uh, undergraduate studies from Jadavpur University and PhD from IOP Bhuvaneshwar. Then he went on to do postdoctoral research in University of Rome and uh, after that in ICTP Trieste. And now uh, currently he's the faculty member at ISES. And his research interest uh, in the various aspects of string theory. So I'll not, uh, I'll not uh, lengthen uh, his introductions because he was very brief in his intro. So oh, welcome Dr. Koshik Roy, uh, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation 
and special thanks to Professor Dhara for bearing with me with all the lapses of deadlines. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, yeah, okay. so um, let's start this discussion. The thing I wanted to discuss today with you is, uh, as the name suggests, an overture for string theory. So it's essentially uh, some kind of um, motivation, uh, especially for younger people. So can we understand the need of string theory from a... Uh, from what we have learned in say in our bachelor's and master's there are many other more serious motivations for doing string theory but how much can we understand how much motivation can we get from the knowledge that we uh, already have in uh, uh, bachelor's and master's so this is going to be a more of a pedagogical nature and probably uh, it's slightly, slightly oversimplified uh, but let's see so let us start from the very beginning with something that uh, everyone in the audience will know, uh, for, uh, namely the uh, Newton's equation. Newton's equation is the equation classical dynamic, describes the classical dynamics of a point particle as it moves under the influence of an external force. And classical dynamics, uh, saying that I know the classical dynamics of a particle means that I know the position of the particle and the velocity of the particle, so which I have written here as capital X and uh, dx dt, uh, as parametrized by a time. If you see by cursor, this is what happens. So this X is a map from real numbers to R three, real number being time. It maps you, it gives you a vector such that it satisfies this differential second order different ordinary differential equation so m is the mass of the particle as usual the second derivative acceleration of the uh, particle is given by this external force as a function of time and space but this x from what we get from this equation is a solution for x in terms of t so x depends on t. So that's the uh, description of a classical dynamics of a point particle of mass m. So next, let's go over to the quantum dynamics. Quantum dynamics is a slightly more subtle. It is given in terms of a Schrodinger equation. The dynamics of a particle of, again, the mass m, and it's kind of strange. Uh, we start the description of a quantum mechanical system in terms of a classical name like a particle. But uh, let's stick to it. Uh, so a particle of mass m is uh, the dynamics is given by a solution to the Schrodinger equation, which is now a partial differential equation. So it has derivatives of x here in the uh, Nabla operator and de derivative with respect to time separately, where psi is now interpreted is a square integrable function, which is normalized as written here. So uh, it's a square integrable function. So the mod square of psi integrated over the whole space gives you unity. And psi square, this mod psi square is interpreted as the probability of finding the particle at a position x in R3 at a time t. So unlike in the previous case, where once I know a solution to the Newton's equations of motion, if I tell you the time, you can give me the position. Here, on the other hand, for psi, I have to specify the position and momentum separately. So psi xt mod square is the probability of finding the particle at a position x at a time. So I have to specify both of them separately. And the normalization guarantees that the particle will be found somewhere at any time. So this is just to stress that in this description, I'm mentioning the position and time separately. Uh, Let's go over to special theory relativity now. So we have talked about non-relativistic classical mechanics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Relativity, on the other hand, looks upon space and time on an equal footing. So these are separate things. One doesn't depend on the other, like in classical dynamics in Newton's equation. So two observers in different reference frames, and reference frames are same thing as coordinate systems, sigma and sigma prime moving with a constant velocity along six axis with respect to each other describe the same event in terms of coordinates which are related by this Lorentz transformation that again everyone knows so if x and t are the coordinates in one reference frame say sigma and then x prime t prime are the 
for given by these formulas are uh, the coordinate systems in the other reference term sigma prime. Now, we need to describe events in terms of quantity which depend on position and time independently. To stress it again, unlike in the classical mechanics, here I have to talk about events where I have to specify this position and time separately. One cannot depend on the other. Another ingredient that will come in is electromagnetic field. So I've written down Maxwell's equations in vacuum. So these are standard four equations. And if you go back you see that here E, which is electric field, depends on X and T separately. Same for B. And the, the components of E and B are functions of X and T. And I have to give you the information of X and T independently, separately. Incidentally, Maxwell's equations are Lorentz invariant. That we, uh, all of us know that uh, it satisfies this wave equation for both. So now we more or less have all the ingredients that we require. Now what we are looking for, say, is a quantum theory of, say, particles, the dynamics of a particle moving it very fast with a relativistic space. So then what do I do? I know that Schrodinger equation is not Lorentz invariant. Uh, so I cannot use Schrodinger equation for this. So to write a quantum theory with Lorentz invariance, we need to describe physics in terms of quantity, which depend on position and time independent gen in general. And these quantities are called fields. So these are fields or quantities that depend on X and T separately. That is in some sense, Special theory of relativity forces field theory upon us. This was actually the historical motivation. Now, what we do now from whatever we have so discussed so far is we use the idea of electric and magnetic fields. These were fields that we know even before quantum mechanics. And along with the probabilistic interpretation that we borrow from Schrodinger's equation, psi. So psi is like a field like electric or magnetic fields. And that, with this probabilistic interpretation, leads to quantum field theories. So there are examples, standard examples of uh, the scalar field phi. It satisfies, again, a wave equation. But let me point out that here I have x and t separately. It's uh, in a Dirac equation, which is uh, for a, a space-time spin-off. And uh, these gamma mu are uh, certain uh, quantities, which we don't need to bother about at the moment. Mu, on the other hand, is a, in the, in the space-time index. The typically, in a <clears throat> Minkowski space, zero is reserved for time and one, two, three for the space. <coughs> Excuse me. We then quantize, so start with this. So, so far, what we described is a, so far, what is called a classical field theory. We then quantize the classical field theory by defining a vacuum and treating fields as operators, creating particles from it or destroying particles into it. And this is a feature which is much beyond quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you had a complete Hilbert space and uh, Psi was a, a member of the complete Hilbert space. Uh, so you could not destroy or create particle within quantum mechanics. Field theory allows you to do that. And that comes as a bonus or burden for having relativity uh, integrated with quantum ideas. <clears throat> we do all that, but usual quantum field theories are plagued with something, some singularity. So at the end of the day, what we want to ask, what we want to get from a field theory is, if I have particles colliding with each other, scattering, can we predict stuff? So I put in two particles, let them collide. I get the scattering data out of it. So can we predict stuff? Otherwise, there's no need of field theory. So we apply quantum field theory to particle scattering. So a particle with a four momentum P, now I'm using a relativistic uh, notation, obviously. So four momentum P is given by a field. So that describes a particle. 
various interactions between particles can be depicted with the Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams, uh, Feynman's fairy tales, uh, so can be interpreted this way. So this thick line is a particle with momentum P coming in. Something happens in between and the same particle go out. Now what happens in between is, is up to you, up to your theory, what you want to describe. Important thing is it can break into two pieces. It can interact with other particles given by the dash, represented by the dashed lines here. And it might split the momentum, the phone momentum P might split into say two parts. A uh, part going with a momentum K, oops, sorry. And another part that goes with a momentum P minus K, that's basically because the momentum has to be conserved throughout. Now, if you look at this, there's something very strange happening. I'm talking about a quantum system. It's relativistic and all, but I'm saying that there's some kind of, so if you think of these dashed lines as two other particles, here's an interaction of particles. This is given. So somehow they're interacting at this point. That means by the uncertainty principle that I'm telling you precisely the position of this vertex or the interact where the interaction is taking place. That means the momentum is to be, will be undefined. And that's precisely what happens. Once you try to calculate the scattering amplitude, you have to do integrals over the momentum. So here you have P is what you specified from the beginning. P is what you get at the end. These are splittings that you have no control over once the interaction is given. So I have to somehow get rid of the case. So I have to somehow there'll be a prescription for integrating K. And this K will be integrated from say zero to all the way to infinity. That's because uncertainty at the vertex tells me that K will not be bounded. And that gives rise, these will, there'll be integrals in this K for momentum K, and there'll be divergences on this integral coming from this infinity, the end of the interval. So the question is, and generally field theory, quantum field theories are plagued with this problem. It has all kinds of singularities that come in. So obviously one was like to avoid singularities. So how do we avoid, try, how do we avoid singularities of field theory scattering amplitude that arise from the specific source? There might be other sources of singularities in scattering amplitude, but the ones that are, arise from so-called point-like interaction. So here's a vertex where I have three particles interacting with a, preci with a precise position and therefore the imprecise momentum all the way up to infinity. So one way of solving this problem is to get rid of the interaction vertex altogether. So that, so I have a problem and if I have no, no description of this interaction vertex, my problem is gone. So this is what happens. So, so I will consider an extended structure. I don't want points anymore, say strings. So now consider the collision of a closed and an open string in the lab frame. I'm sitting in the lab frame. I'm, so and this stick is an open string. Uh, this loop is a closed string. So let's consider it's, so this loop goes on the horizontal axis. The stick comes from down. So next step is here and here. So now there are, so now use the uh, length contraction paradox. We knew that in that paradox, there was this, uh, in the resolution of the paradox, although the frame of the loop sees the stick contracted and vice versa, it in the end, if I have this situation, the stick will pass through the whole loop. That is because, the, the, if you remember the resolution, that the two events, P1 and P2, which are the overlaps of the open string, the stick with the loop, that these two points where they intersect, these two are events in the space-time in the sigma frame, say. 
if they are simultaneous in the frame sigma, they are not simultaneous in the frame sigma prime given by the uh, white axis after the Lorentz transformation. So if this is the situation, that means these two events, P1 and P2, which are the intersections or interaction vertices of these two structures, they are not a Lorentz invariant concept altogether. So if I consider instead of particle, point particles, if I considered extended objects like this loop and the stick, then the interaction vertex is no more a Lorentz invariance concept. So in a relativistic formulation of whatever, a field theory or whatever, the, any problem that, so there's nothing called interaction vertex and any problem that might come with it is gone. So this basically was, is one of the big motivations for doing string theory. So I'm, I'm bringing in extended objects in the theory instead of uh, not only particles and uh, that will get rid of some problems of the usual quantum field theory, which I started um, derived or formulated on the basis of Schrodinger equation and Lorentz transformation, taking cues from Maxwell's equations. So let's, uh, uh, if there are questions at this point, uh, I might take questions. Okay, uh, so if there are no questions, let's go ahead uh, with string theory. So this 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 is basically the motivation for considering uh, extended structures in string theory. So hence, a relativistic theory of string scattering does not have an interaction vertex, and hence the. Doctor, okay, maybe we have a questions here yes. at this point. Please. So uh, uh, let me read out: Can string theory provide insights into the behavior of black holes? Oh, Deep, I think he's, he's not yet there. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, we are not into black holes yet. <laughs> So yeah, uh, let's wait for uh, uh, his talk to finish. Then maybe we might. I, I I'm not going to discuss black holes here. I'm just trying yeah. to discuss, give a very uh, basic a, motivation for string theory. Black holes are advanced. At stuff. this point, I can have a. I have a question. Sure, yeah. ma'am. Sure, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, the if you to get rid of the singularity, uh, 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 we can use the dimensional regularization. Uh, yeah, but dimensional regularization itself will ask, I mean, whose dimension it is. And uh, we are talking about... Uh, that is the usual method in uh, quantum field theory for getting rid of the... Yes, but uh, which, 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 which single... So as I said, there are many sources of singularities in field theory, ultraviolet, infrared... Infrared, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so various kinds. So uh, dimensional regularization doesn't help you, first of all, in uh, doing uh, uh, removing all singularities. You cannot do that. Okay. okay. Uh, these are basically coming at the at the level of uh, point particle interactions. Interaction vertices are always singular in field theory. So Something when you consider in extended object, is there anything related to uh, form factor usually we use? It did. It did. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, so it actually. Uh, uh, so I, I'll not get into that. But the okay. QCD motivation did come from that. So when people talked about form factors, and as you know. Very well, that uh, then uh, Veneziano came up with uh, uh, STU invariant stuff and all in the dual resonance days. Yes. Okay. Thank it you. was indeed uh, with the external structures, but that will require a lot of QCD, which I uh, didn't want to get into for this talk. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to keep things as basic as possible. So, yeah. Okay. So, Again, go back to classical dynamics of strings. We have discussed classical dynamics of uh, particles so far. So generalize the classical dynamics of particles, take two from there. So in the classical dynamics, I had this XT, X was in R3, so three-dimensional stuff. And this was parametrized as we discussed by a real number called time. This will generalize. So now if I, so that is, for example, this is an example. A particle that moves in a spiral. Everyone knows this. So in the X, Y, Z coordinates are parametrized by this time T. So a parametrized curve is the trajectory of a particle and it hopefully satisfies some equation for some force. If I want to generalize this to strings, that means 
the po this point is ex being extended i'll call that a sigma so that's the length direction of the string and it evolves in time and uh, that something i will call a tau so if i call this an x mu t where mu would have been 0 1 2 3 etc will generalize to an another uh, which i called a capital x mu now it has to be a function of tau and sigma that should be very clear from these two pictures that if this was the trajectory of a point particle that will be parameterized by a single time now this is the trajectory so think of this sigma direction as a loop that goes around in this tau direction so this is like a string moving in time so at this point you are switching over to carvelian coordinates or you are still uh, this uh, no uh, it, it's completely up to you Okay. Because this will be uh, uh, Lorentz invariant, so there will be space, space time indices will be soaked up wherever they appear. For for the ease of uh, de <coughs> depiction, I'm using a torus. You can use a cylinder as simple as that. Yeah, that would be product space also. I mean, uh, torus yeah, and yeah. cylinder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That will be a product space. Torus is slightly more non-trivial. That's why I want just yeah. All kinds will come in. Any any so so any surface of evolution of uh, any extended object, any one dimensional object will be a surface, right? So the extended object, namely the string is given by the extension of that object is given by the Sigma coordinate. And tau is as if the time. So if I want to describe the motion of this string in a time T, I'll have to embed this so-called world sheet of string. This was the world line of the particle embedded in this space time. This is the generalized to world sheet of a string and that will be embedded in the space time by these parameterizations with respect to tau and sigma. And similarly, x dot will generalize to d sigma and d tau, del sigma, del tau. <coughs> one can also write as this is a surface after all. So one writes a complex <clears throat> variable with sigma and tau, and I can also describe this in terms of z and uh, z bars. Now remember, this x, y, z is generalized to this x mu, and mu I have provisionally set to zero to d minus one, so with some dimension, not restricted to four anymore. I'll uh, comment on this a little later. So this is the generalization of the classical dynamics of particles to classical dynamics of strings, where the single parameter, real parameter T is generalized to two parameters, and this gives the embedded structure here. Equations of motion. <clears throat> the free particle equation of motion was this, d2x dt2 equal to zero. And free string equation of motion is generalized to this, where I have second derivative with respect to tau and sigma. So this basically is the Laplacian operator. Uh, if you use this z and uh, complex coordinates, one also sees that this is related to the cauchy rima condition in complex analysis. So that essentially means that uh, these will be, this x mu's are holomorphic functions of Z and uh, separate anti-holomorphic functions of uh, so this will be separated into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions with respect to Z and Z bar. Now we have a Laplace equation here in extent tau. So then one has to know if I want to solve this to do the uh, study the dynamics of strings, uh, of course they'll have, have to put in boundary conditions. So different kinds of boundary conditions are allowed, as we know. If it's a closed string, then the in the embedding space, as in the case of torus, uh, if, it's, if it's a closed string, then this is going to be this loop, the so sigma in the sigma direction. So the x mu for all arbitrary tau are equal from zero to the length of the string. So that's what is a closed string. So this is a, x mu's are periodic functions. If it's a closed string, it's a loop, nothing but a loop, a circle. So therefore, x mu's are periodic functions in the sigma direction with periodicity L. 
So that's the closed string boundary condition along with a momentum condition here. Again, the momentum is has to be periodic. Otherwise, uh, there'll be, uh, so if, if I have a loop, this is exactly like vibration of a uh, closed string actually. And uh, then I can have Newman or Dirichlet boundary conditions for open strings as we know. The Newman condition tells us that at L and zero, so now this is like a, the stick in the Lorentz contraction uh, picture. At zero and L at the two endpoints of the string, I have this derivatives of uh, X with respect to sigma zero. That basically tells us that a moment, there's no momentum that goes out of the uh, uh, out of the two ends of the open string. I can also put the open strings to constant given Dirichlet boundary condition. All these are allowed if I'm talking about a Laplace equation. Here again, mu is from zero to d minus one. So this is a d-dimensional space time that I'm talking about. The i's where I have Newman boundary conditions are taken from zero to p and the m's when I have where I'm considering the Dirichlet boundary conditions are from say, the rest of it, so p plus one to d minus one. Now there's something very interesting. If I want to do, use this, something very interesting will happen. I'm saying that xm for some of the directions at some points, xm is constant. And that is in direct contradiction with the special theory of relativity. The Dirichlet condition will break translation or Poincare invariance of the space time. I'm, so this is like the open string in space time. I am fixing the two endpoints by Dirichlet boundary condition. So I'm choosing points here and I'm breaking Poincare invariance. That's directly, so Poincare or translation and invariance, there'll be no momentum. So everything contradicts anything that is related to special theory of relativity. Now, what comes to rescue for this are some things called D-brains. What I can do, instead of just put choosing two points in the space-time, I introduce more extended structures, like these planes here, the red and green planes. The, this end of the open string can rest on the green plane, and it can move on the green plane freely. Because if you uh, look at it, I have fixed, given the Dirichlet boundary condition only in certain directions, not in the I directions. And similarly for this point, this end point, this can move over the red brains. So this D brains are even higher dimensional structures in string theory. They are there. In fact, this was a reason sometimes people say string theory is not only a theory of strings, but it's a theory of even higher dimensional extended objects. They have their own <clears throat> description and they are actually, by the way, related to black holes, these D brains themselves. So the point now is the way to save the world is I allow this constant here at the end points, but they can wander about in the corresponding planes, but that's not enough. These debrains have now uh, spoiled Poincare invariance. So what one allows is, allow the debrains to move. So now the picture is, I have this open string whose two boundaries are on these two debrains. So they can move around on, on the debrains and to res rescue Poincare invariance, the debrains themselves can move in space time. So now nothing is broken. The whole translation and invariance has come up, although I have been able to use the Dirichlet boundary condition in certain way. So at the end point of a string lying on a D brain will support. So at these points on a string, it, it can support gauge fields, charges, as does ordinary particles, because these are like the end points of the strings are like exactly like particles. So they can, they can support charges and it one day, maybe it will be possible to describe the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 standard model gauge group of particle physics from string theory. But as of now, the gauge group, which yield consistent string theories are way too big. So we have an embarrassment of reaches here. 
and we have no principle for reducing the gauge group to just SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Our age group is much, 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 much bigger. So that is so far an embarrassment for uh, string theory, but uh, there is research ongoing in that direction. So hopefully one day we'll understand this. So <clears throat> I will uh, end soon with this, uh, just, write, just writing down the uh, actions of these uh, strings. So again, the classical action is modeled on the classical action of a massless uh, classical particle in Minkowski space. So if I'm, I was in uh, D dimensions, uh, where there'd be different directions given by zero to D minus one, the classical action of a particle is given by uh, this, where there's an integration over this, this is the Lagrangian density and uh, dx mu are the different embedding directions. Eta mu nu is the Minkowski metric if I'm in Minkowski space time. So it has a signature minus one and then one, 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 et cetera. And there is a reparametrization invariance here. So I can change T to T prime, nothing changes in the action. Lagrangian will change, but the integration of T dt will take care of it. And so the measure of integration will change. Exactly similarly, the action for a classical string is now given by this, where instead of tau uh, t, I have d sigma d tau. So it's an integral over a two-dimensional surface. And now there'll be two matrix, one for the mu indices, for the space times, one for, as uh, Professor Mukherjee asked, this is where I might use curvilinear coordinates. So A and B are the two indices for tau and sigma, and H is an arbitrary matrix in principle. So I can uh, use curvilinear whatever coordinates I uh, want to choose and I can change coordinates. Nothing will change because of this invariant volume here element here. So the action for classical string will be invariant under the change of the coordinates of the world sheet. The sigma and tau can be changed to sigma prime um, tau prime, etc. And similarly for uh, x mu where x mu are contracted with this new metric g mu nu. Now, to do further calculations, one uses something called a conformal gauge, where the world sheet coordinates, sigma and tau, are chosen such that the corresponding metric has this form. This can always be done in two dimension. One can check that uh, this can always be done. So the two dimensional metric is some scale factor with a Minkowski matrix, the flat Minkowski matrix, just uh, no obstruction in doing this. With this choice, this action for the string will look like this. I don't need to uh, uh, get into the details. The only thing is, important thing is with uh, all the scaling and all, uh, the H is gone and G, this capital G has remained. And the equation from here, you can derive the equation motion for the strings in this form, there's no, uh, th this minus sign is now be uh, there because I'm using a Minkowski metric with a, a Lorentzian signature. The reason to mention all this is that, as I said, so I have this G mu nu, which is the space time metric of the X's, the capital X's. Now, to make this theory, so, so far what we discussed is the classical action, classical equation of motion. So once we try to quantize this theory, the quantum consistency of this theory requires that D, this D is 26. And on the other hand, is that's bad news because I was... Uh, our world, as as of as we know, is like a four-dimensional thing. I'm now giving a theory which is only consistent in 26 dimensions. But the good news is this G mu nu for the quantum consistency will have to satisfy Einstein equations. So far, in all that I have described, there was no allusion to the general theory of relativity. So we considered extended structures, modeled its classical action after a classical point particle, and uh, wrote down a theory. I had these indices to soak up. So I put in the G mu nu, which looked like a metric in the X spaces. But now quantum consistency tells me that G mu satisfies Einstein equations for gravity, 
as if g mu nu is the metric of space time and its uh, perturbative corrections apologies for missing e here uh, so that is apart from the fact that it's as as we discussed that op at the end of open string i could have had a gauge theory now it's here is something which telling me that i can actually see einstein equations here so i have gravity here so here is one theory where i have gravity after quantization as well as gauge theory and it might therefore be a very good candidate for a unified quantum theory of gauge theory and gravity there's no other theory that we know of so far which has both the features in it uh, and in particular this feature the fact that this einstein equation is satisfied by g mu nu comes from a consistency requirement of uh, internal consistency of the theory it's not imposed by hand uh, the bad news of course is this uh, that equal to 26 there are ways to cure it uh, I don't think uh, I will get into that, but about the black hole question, uh, black holes comes uh, into string theory through this path. First of all, this G mu nu will be a black hole matrix in a space time. And then one can identify, as you can imagine, it's difficult, but one can identify these black holes as the D brains that I showed a few slides back. Um, in a very particular fashion and all, but uh, it's, a it's a very complicated calculation. There are checks and balances, and string theory is uh, in, in a very restricted uh, domain of uh, consistency uh, corners. Uh, string theory has so far shown that it, it is, in some sense, uh, describes uh, gravity, gauge theory, as well as uh, some of the features of uh, black hole solutions in it. And it might offer a one day uh, quantum theory of uh, black holes as well as the unified quantum theory. So I think uh, I'll uh, bring this torture on you to an end with this. And uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Professor Roy, for a nice introduction uh, to string theory. So our forum is now open for questions. So I can see uh, one question from Rishabh Gupta. Uh, so uh, he's saying that it's not a question, but a confusion actually in quantum field theory. Uh, in actually, in quantum field theory, is the momentum of a particle or the invariance of transformations in Minkowski, spa Minkowski space consistent for each type, allowing us to use a normalization constant for? Okay, Rishabh, I think I mean. I'm not doing justice to your question. So maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question straight to you, the speaker. Rishabh, are you there? Rishabh Gupta? Uh, uh, can anyone please unmute uh, Rishabh Gupta, please? I can unmute. No. Uh, Papia? Uh, let me check. Oh, I have actually, already unmuted. Yeah. I, he has problem. He okay. has problem in his mic. So okay. Uh, so let me uh, read out once again. Uh, uh, so he's saying it's a, not a question but a confusion. Okay. Actually, in quantum field theory, is the momentum of a particle slash the invariance of transformations in Minkowski space? consistent for each type allowing uh, us to yeah, i don't think i fully understand the question but uh, yeah the point is um, uh, if you are talking about momentum in a minkowski space there's no problem uh, this is essentially given by the fourier dual of uh, space coordinates uh, as in as in usual quantum mechanics except that uh, in a standard fourier transform you have e to the power i k dot r this dot has Dot now uh, it requires the matrix. That's all. That's all that changes. And in a quantum field theory, we usually have Poincaré invariance, so there's no uh, problem in defining a quantum version of a momentum as a generator of space-time translation. Of course, as usual, the fourth component, zeroth component of um, um, four momentum will be energy and all. So with those, there is as it is no problem. Now the, there is a problem. Probably he's um, hinting to that. That when you try to write down the canonical commutation relations, you act usually in a standard formulation of quantum field theory, you use equal time commutators. 
commutators at different time has been studied. Uh, it's actually a very important uh, area of research right at the moment. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's rather complicated. It's a prescription dependent. There's things called uh, uh, Keldish or Swinger formalisms, uh, which in some sense takes care of it. Uh, but on the other hand, if you, for example, use uh, Feynman's path integral way of quantizing things, then this confusion doesn't arise. Uh, it's always an equal time. It, it, uh, as it is, has a, a ordering in time inbuilt in it. So most of the standard calculations of field theory can be understood from this point of view. I'm not sure I answered his question, but. Um... Okay. Uh, so. Uh... Uh, the second question is from Shomorendra Nath. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice and informative lecture. I'm from experimental thank physics you. background. Sir, what I want to know that what is the use of string theory in real world or application in real ground? Uh, as it is, if you ask me, string theory per se has, doesn't have a play. I mean, I, I already said that it may be, may be a good candidate if you look at the last slide. So uh, we don't know, but on the other hand, it's definitely true that, uh, so I just mentioned uh, briefly that there's something called a conformal gauge, and this is related to something like a conformal field theory in two dimensions. Uh, so conformal essentially means that apart from standard space-time invariances, uh, you have things like a scaling invariance of your fields, of your system as well. So many of the techniques that were developed to do string theory has been in uh, applied and uh, again recently even in condensed matter physics where they can nowadays with the uh, advent of uh, this um, cold atoms and all they can actually design systems where you have the various kinds of symmetries etc and check many of the calculations that people originally developed for string theory in a two dimensional condensed matter setting so in that sense in a restricted laboratory experiment, uh, many of these things has been utilized and uh, even verified. Uh, maybe the theory part is misnomer because quantum, like quantum field theory is a framework. So string theory may be a framework. So it you is build model, a real world it's model. A, for absolutely, that absolutely. absolutely. Can... Thank you. Thank you for uh, point uh, mentioning this. Uh, so it's, it's like a, a, a like a standard mo I mean, uh, model is a model. It's not field theory. Field theory is much more bigger than that. It's only a one example somehow in quantum field theory, which is a formalism. And somehow one example of it is uh, describe some part of parts of some features of nature. Similarly, I would also, um, I, I completely agree with the Professor Mukherjee and I also will advertise for thinking of string theory more of like a formalism rather than a theory. It's uh, unfortunate that uh, this, the name theory stuck it with it uh, from the 70s. Okay, thank you, sir. So any other questions from the audience? Uh, um... Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Please. Yeah. I just uh, want to know, Goshi, can you say anything whether you have considered the dimension 26? What does it exactly mean? Uh, actually, and, what and happened, how we come right. this real world of four dimension? Uh, like right. That. So there are two things. So as I just uh, um, wrote, it's a quantum consistency. It essentially means that if you, uh, yeah, if you look at this action of a classical string, X mu's are like actually scalar fields. Uh, each x mu is like a scalar field. So I have basically, this is a theory where a b directions are for sigma tau, but I have certain d number of scalar <coughs> fields depending on these two dimensional coordinates. Now, you try to quantize and all, then you, you will see that there's an anomaly that comes in. So to, for anomaly cancellation, requires this d to be equal to 26 so <clears throat> otherwise it will be a non uh, it will be an anomalous theory so uh, so that is the quantum consistency uh, i didn't want to mention the name anomaly but uh, anomaly consistency uh, uh, cancellation requires this to be equal to 26 now <clears throat> obviously uh, we don't we don't live in uh, uh, 26 dimensions so there are things uh, so what one can think <clears throat> think of is if you look at it again <coughs> excuse me so there's nothing that tells me that all these dimensions, the extent of all the dimensions will have to be the same. That's not required anywhere. So one can think, and one has actually thought 
string theory so far as as if apart from the four that we live in other directions are very small in uh, so they are wrapped up uh, technically called compactified and so they might be that uh, so suppose that, uh, so it's like a scale, um, direct product of the four dimensions in space time with a very small sphere or a very small torus or very small other uh, space of uh, 22 dimensions so these are go by the name of uh, kaluza klein so people use kaluza klein theories kaluza klein theories were developed much before uh, string theory in the uh, 20s or 30s i think and so so you basically make uh, some of the directions the 22 of them uh, to, to be very small and keep only the four big but again the, uh, there is no principle in this formalism of string theory which tells you how to do this this so far is an experimental input. Okay. Thank you. So, oh, sorry, sorry, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you, ma'am. So, another question from Soumen Roy. So, uh, he's asking what can be a possible way to experimentally verify the presence of string strings within the subatomic particles and different vibrational modes of these strings in the multidimensional space uh, no i don't think at the right at the moment we are uh, uh, any close to an ex direct experimental evidence for strings uh, there is because essentially because uh, if if at all string theory is valid at something like a Planck scale but there's no question of doing experiment but uh, some of the new research on black hole radiations, uh, etc., might restrict or verify some features of string theory, some predictions of string theory. That's that's an expectation. I don't think one uh, we are uh, at all ready, or and uh, I, I think it will be uh, too much to aspire that we'll have uh, uh, direct uh, evidence of strings because we'll never simulate Planck scale. So unless there's something of a relic that has that reaches us someday from Big Bang and all. I don't think there's a hope of directly seeing strings. Again, it's like a it's like a formalism. You don't want to see all kinds of fields. You just want use this formalism to predict something. So probably one day we'll, we'll, we'll uh, maybe one of the students who are here will come up with a model using the string theory formalism, which will describe nature more accurately. Thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your time and uh, for nicely thank explaining for all the me. features. <laughs> Okay, okay. So with this, uh, we come to end of this session. So uh, maybe uh, Shatrupa will take up from uh, now, uh, from here on, right, Papia? So, so if yes, you permit sir. me, I will thank try you. to leave the meeting. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. Thank, thank, you. thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your nice Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank thank you, you for sir. inviting. Thank you, thank sir. you so much, sir. So thank you, Dr. Mukherjee, for hosting the session, and thank you, Dr. Koshik Roy, for this nice presentation. Thank you, so Dr. Bhattacharya, for having me. So let's move towards the next session. Uh, for this session, I will request Dr. Shatarupa Vishash as a chair of the session and Dr. Diptushikha Das as a co-chair of the session. Dr. Shatarupa Vishash joined Adamas University in February 2019 as an assistant professor of physics in School of Science. She has done her BTech in biomedical engineering from Chiliguri Institute of Technology and MTech also in biomedical engineering from Jadavpur University. She has completed her PhD from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and her area of specialization includes neural rehabilitation, micro device fabrication, simulation of medical devices, electropsychological, psychology, and biomedical instrumentation. Welcome Dr. Shatarupa Vishash in this session. And Dr. Deepto Shikha Das is post-graduated from Presidency College, University of Calcutta in 2010 and completed her PhD from Rajabaja Science College, University of Calcutta. She has joined Adamas University in the year 2017 and she is the assistant professor in the department. Her research work deals with the synthesis and characterization of polycrystalline thermoelectric material and preparing the device module. She is also involved in the synthesis of a P and T type, N type T material. Welcome Dr. Dipto Shikha Dash for this session. Now over to you Dr. Vishash and Dr. Dash. 
thank you dr bhattacharya for the nice introduction so, and um, uh, very good morning to all the participants uh, and um, uh, my colleagues so in this session we have uh, 10 speakers so uh, i would like to uh, welcome uh, first dr komalika hajra um, uh, uh, she is an assistant professor of the acharya jagadish chandra bose college kolkata and uh, she will be presenting on an overview of complex networks. So uh, over to you, Dr. Kamalika Hajra. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bishash. And uh, am I audible? And am I good? Yes, you are audible. Uh, thank you so much. So I will uh, share the screen first. So please just let me know if my screen is visible. Yes, your screen is visible. You can make it a full screen. And I also, I would request you to stick to the uh, time limit that is given. I just want to go to slideshow. Um, Yes, so um, thank you for uh, giving me a chance to present uh, this work. Um, the slideshow actually is not uh, like the full screen mode is not visible to us. Uh, can you uh, reshare the, the, your screen so that uh, the slideshow will be visible? So you will have to share the screen, not the file. Yeah, actually, I'm in sh I'm sharing the screen. Okay, just so I'll pause share and then go to slideshow. Stop share and then again. Uh, now is it visible? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. So thank you so much. So uh, as you can see, the um, topic of my work is complex networks. I have been working on this uh, during my PhD and postdoctoral uh, phases. And um, thank you for letting me present this uh, in the YPM 2023 uh, at the Physics Department of Adamus University, Kolkata. So, so to start my presentation, I quote a uh, very uh, known, well-known network physicists, Dorogopsev and Mendes, who in their book, Evolution of Networks said, we live in a world of networks and networks form the core of our civilization. So in this brief 15 minutes, I will try to give you an overview of what this statement means and why this statement is so true. Um, to give, to start with, I will give a few examples of where networks uh, are applicable and uh, the examples will themselves show that they are practically applicable everywhere in, uh, in the world that we live in uh, and beyond that. So the human brain is basically a network of neurons connected by synapses. We have all done a little bit of high school biology, those who people like me who have left biology in school, uh, but we still know this, that uh, neurons are connected by junctions called synapses. So basically the human brain is nothing but can be visualized as a network, a network of neurons which are connected by synapses. Moving over uh, to a more well-known, widely known uh, realm of the World Wide Web, the internet uh, that we are so, that is a parcel, part and parcel of our lives uh, nowadays. Uh, we cannot imagine our lives without the internet. And the World Wide Web is again, uh, typically a model that can be thought of as a network of web pages or URLs 
which are connected by hyperlinks. So basically, when we click on a particular web page, we go to that web page, we are linked to that web page. And from a, from a particular web page, we can go to another one and then another one. And so this is how this, this picture from the internet that I've downloaded, it shows how the different, the, the thousands of URLs in the world are connected through hyperlinks. The ecosystem, again, moving to biology, um, we know the ecosystem consists of the organisms, living organisms, and the connection between the living organisms uh, in terms of predator-prey relationship. And so uh, the ecosystem can again be thought of as a network of participating organisms and the relations between them. More familiar to us who uh, work, uh, who have worked as researchers and who are working as researchers is uh, the term collaboration. So in this, uh, in today's world where uh, remote communication is uh, rampant, collaboration is also rampant and uh, a collaboration network can be formed when uh, two authors are linked as they co-author a paper. So two or more authors, and uh, we say a link is established between them when they co-author a particular paper. So here I have taken a picture of a collaboration network uh, from a particular group. And uh, examples can go on, and I can uh, continue for an hour giving you just examples of networks, but I obviously cannot do that. So I'll uh, try to uh, give you a little bit of uh, what a picture of what a network means, what are the typical terms that we need to identify and analyze a network. I will not go into much mathematical jargon or show you a lot of graphs, but uh, I, I would try to keep my talk uh, qualitative because this is a field where, where a few people work. So I try to keep the talk as, as non-technical as possible. So as we have seen from the previous examples, uh, a network typically has participants and um, relations between these participants. So these participants are called nodes in the uh, academic term. These participating um, um, parameters are called nodes, and the relation between the participants are called links. So we can define a network as a collection of nodes with links between them, as simple as that. No matter what the how complicated the system is, if we picture it as a network, it will simply be a collection of nodes with links between them. So Suppose we have a node like this and another and another. So these are a few nodes. We can think of them as the organisms in the ecosystem, as the co-authors uh, of a, as papers in a collaboration network, as web pages in uh, the internet. And I just give them some names, A, B, C, D, E, F, et cetera. And links are established between them. A link is established when one node establishes a relationship with another node in whatever may be the way possible, depending on the network that we are, depending on the system that we are uh, studying. So nodes are linked in uh, a particular manner. And then we uh, define, so these are the nodes, the points are the nodes and the lines between them are the links, which I hope is clear by now. So uh, we define certain terms like the degree of a particular node. So a degree would be the number of links arising from a particular node, okay? So in this particular picture, in this figure, the degree Ka of the node A, as you can see, is three. There are three links that arise from A, so its degree is three. Whereas the degree of the node C is two because two links arise from it. This is just for uh, 
explaining what we mean by degree and how will we consider how will we calculate the distance between two nodes in according to network geometry simply the number of steps between them okay so for example the distance between the nodes a and c is 2 because we, there are two steps in moving from a to c whereas the distance from a to d is 3 um, 1 2 3 it can also be 2 or 1 so depending on how we are in the network we will define the distance between two nodes so there are certain qualifying parameters of a network like the diameter which is the maximal shortest path the degree distribution which is the final goal of any network scientist to study after the system has been simulated it is the probability that a particular node has exactly k degrees and the clustering coefficient which gives us the tendency of cluster formation in the network now the nature of a network primarily depends on how these links are established between the nodes, okay? So there can be two kinds of linking schemes. One is random and the other is preferential attachment. So I'll briefly describe what these two kinds of linking schemes are. So when the linking scheme of uh, a network is random, it means that there is no preference while establishing a connection. There is no choice for the node to establish a connection with another node. It can choose any node at random from the entire network and just connect with it. And the resultant network is called, is known as the small world. So in this picture, uh, it is shown, this is a work by Watson, Strogerts, and later on, Iddors and Rene. Uh, we start from a regular network, as you can see in the first figure, where there are links only between nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors. Here, the probability of linking with any other node is zero. But the moment there is a certain probability where a link from one of the nearest or next nearest neighbor is detached and the node is allowed to go and connect with any other distant node in the network, we get what is known as a small world. And as the probability of linking to distant nodes approaches one, we see that the network becomes completely random. Okay, so this was a model which shows how regular to random transition takes place as the rewiring probabilities tune. Obviously, this is more of a theoretical and academic interest because in the real world, we hardly ever establish links with uh, random people uh, or in any system, random link establishment is hardly the case. However, the small world effect was in fact uh, demonstrated in the society uh, in the famous experiment by Stanley Milgram. Stanley Milgram was a psychologist, an American psychologist, and he did an experiment where he chose two people, one sender and one target. This was done in the 1960s, remember, where when there was no social network, no ne internet. So his experiment was that this person A would have to hand deliver a letter to this person B, who he does not know at all, through people who they know on first name basis. So apparently this task is completely impossible. It seems completely impossible, especially in the 1960s, where probably the telephone directory was all one could have. However, 20% of the attempts were successful and the average search length, the length in which A could establish a link with this unknown target B was just six, 6.5 to be precise. So this gave the famous six degrees of separation, which is why we call it a small world. So even if two people are completely unknown, 
they can reach each other only through six steps. However, this, as I told you, is of more theoretical and academic interest. But in real networks, the attachment is preferential. So the attachment is according to a certain choice and the resulting network is what we know as scale-free. I'll just tell you what it means. But the examples of such linking schemes, the most popular linking scheme is when the attachment probability is degree dependent. As I told you, degree means the number of links arising from a particular node. So the probability pi is the probability of a particular node having a certain degree uh, is ki, which means that a node which already has many links will get more nodes linking with it. So when a new node enters the network, it will look for the node which has highest degree or close to high degree, and it will go and link with that. So this is more relevant to us. For example, we tend to go to web pages which are more popular. We go and see YouTube videos which, are, which have more views. We go and link with people with, who have more connections. We go and cite more people more papers which are already well cited. So this makes the network uh, a scenario where the rich gets richer, okay? So this is a typical example of such a network. And as you can see that there are a few nodes which have many links and most nodes have just one link and that is with that particular node which have many links. So these nodes, in such a network, which we call scale-free, are called hubs. So preferential attachment gives rise to networks where we have many hubs. These hubs are the ones where the whose degree is very high. And this is a typical model which was designed first by the Barabasi Albert uh, group. And they um, sort of analyzed a plethora of real-world network using this scheme. So the degree distribution in such a model is typically a power of the degree. So the, the probability that a particular node has k degrees goes as a power of the general degree and the power is always found to be close to three and this is a very general model. So this is a power, the degree here has a power law distribution and from this distribution you can see there are few nodes which have very high degree and mostly uh, there are few nodes, there are more nodes which have a few degrees, a few links arising from them. So this indicates the presence of hubs. So this is why they are called scale-free networks in the sense that the degree distribution does not follow any particular scale. It is just a simple fact-tailed power law and this is common to most of the real world networks. The presence of these hubs uh, is very significant because such networks will be resistant to accident failures and random damage. Because if a particular node is damaged, it wouldn't affect the entire network because it has that only that node will be damaged and the rest of the network will remain safe. However, if a hub is damaged, one of the hubs is attacked, then the system will, this network will um, dissolve. Why? Because such networks are extremely vulnerable to coordinated attacks like epidemics. We have just encountered a pandemic and you can understand why social distancing was such an important thing during that pandemic. Because a person who is contaminated, if he is uh, he or she gets in touch with another one, then it will spread uh, immensely. And that is what happened. Uh, we all have just come out of the trauma of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this network theory uh, tells us how this happened. So uh, uh, just uh, I'm uh, 
Hi, to interrupt uh, if you can uh, wrap up because yes, we have I, a I am almost over. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are several other kinds of attachment probabilities like distance dependent, time dependent, or combination of several uh, types of attachment probabilities. And these have been studied, applications have been made, and phase transitions have also been observed when the these parameters of the attachment probabilities are fine-tuned. So finally, I would just like to say why we would like to study networks, why networks should be a very popular uh, academic uh, field. First of all, the universality, systems of extremely diverse nature, as I give, gave you examples, show similar behavior. Phase transitions take place and numerical simulation method like the Monte Carlo method, as well as analytical tools of StatMec, can help understand several kinds of diverse real world systems using this method. And this diversity invokes a plethora of interdisciplinary collaborations, which creates a blurring of subject boundaries, which is the picture of today's academic world, I guess. These are the references. And thank you so much for giving me this time. Thank you, Dr. Hajra. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Uh, in the chat box, I cannot find any questions. So, yes. so I have a question. Yes, please. So it's a very nice work. Uh, so I just want to ask you how the phase transition is linked with the uh, uh, like connections and links. Could you please explain it in a like much simpler Actually, way? I have not kept any graphs or uh, mathematical equations in my talk because this is uh, something that not many people are aware of. But it is seen that a network transits from being a random network to a scale-free network or from being highly attached to being completely detached. And that is what we know we are calling phase transition, not in the sense of the phase transition that we study in solid state physics, but the phases of the networks can be, uh, you know, there is transition between the different phases of the network, meaning from being connected to being non -con not connected uh, is what I'm talking about, from being random to being scale -free, from being small world to being random, from being regular to being scaly. And these are shown by graphs, uh, which I have not shown here, I'm uh, afraid, but these have been studied mathematically as well as analytically and sim from simulations. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? If not, then uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Hajra, for uh, taking out time and participating in this uh, program. Uh, so I will go to the next uh, speaker. I would request Dr. Tomal Shorkar, uh, who is a, a National Postdoctoral Fellow at IIT Kharagpur, um, to share your screen. And uh, Dr. Shorkar will be talking on effects of quantum dots on angulation kinetics of silica gel. Uh, thank you so much. Is my screen visible to everybody? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk in front of you and present uh, one of my uh, work, which I have carried out in my uh, PhD duration. So uh, in the title of the talk, as uh, Madam said, that effect of uh, quantum dots on uh, gelation kinetics of silica gel. So here, uh, uh, sorry. Um, uh, OK, so uh, you can see the schematic uh, diagram of this entire work where, uh, where the first file contain, uh, is containing uh, silica sol and TEOS, tetraethyl ortho silicate is the main precursor of this sol here. And the orange dots you are seeing are the carbon dots. Carbon dots here I use as a quantum dots because it shows uh, 
emissive uh, property like quantum dots. Uh, in this whole study, I wanted to see when this silica sol in presence of carbon dots proceeds towards a gel and then as a, a zero gel state, how we can actually uh, capture this solution to gel and zero relation through, uh, through our physical uh, characteristics like uh, uh, dynamic slide catering and geological study. So I will show this study in two parts where I will show how this gelation or zero gelation happens without the, uh, without the presence of uh, uh, this carbon dots and with the presence of carbon dots through this dynamic slide scattering and geological point of view. The motivation uh, to do this study was how we can uh, modulate the property of a silica gel chemically or physically and also how to reduce the gelation time of this silica salt so usually i don't know the uh, so usually uh, for a, a silica gel to happen through a salt gel polymerization method it usually takes two days to form this gel kind of structure from this solution state now uh, as this is too long a time. I wanted to reduce the gelation time by incorporating carbon dots uh, inside the silica uh, sol matrix. So now, uh, as I told that it is a two part uh, presentation in part one, I'll show the salt to gel transition. And in part two, salt, same salt to gel transition of silica with in, in presence of carbon dots. And I'll end the talk with the conclusion. Moving on, I cannot change the slide. Uh, uh, are you all seeing the, uh, this slide where I have see, uh, shown a uh, table of soldier polymerization? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, in, in, in this work, silica gel was prepared using sol gel polymerization method. And I described earlier that TEOS, tetraethyl ortho silicate is the main precursor for this silica. And I had taken it in different percent of volume by volume ratio, starting from 20, which is lower. And, and I ended with 30, which is uh, higher. And, uh, and two, uh, two additional solvents are also used, which is ethanol and acidic water, uh, which has a pH of uh, close to one. And this sol gel polymerization method is a two-step method. Uh, first, hydrolysis happen, which is followed by the condensation. So in the process of hydrolysis, this TEOS molecule in presence of uh, this acidic water and ethanol uh, forms this silanol uh, molecules with uh, OH group uh, replaced uh, the, uh, the hydrocarbons. So now in the condensation step, when these two silanols are coming together uh, by, uh, by releasing one molecule of H2O, they form uh, this SiO, Si, which is siloxane bond. Now this, as, as the time grows, as the time grows, like in this case, as the time grows, when it is near to relation, this SiOSI bond act forms chain kind of uh, thing, a long chain. Now with time, this chain actually forms, uh, these chains get interconnected with each other and form a gel network. Now moving on, I wanted to show that how this dynamics from solution to uh, gel or zero, zero gel happens through dynamic light scattering study. So zero gel is a state of gel where the gel is dehydrated. So you can see uh, in the left column, I have shown the dynamic light scattering data for 22% TEO, TEOS and the, in the right hand side, it is 30% TEOS. So you could see uh, that the I have plot, there are uh, in this profile of intensity versus time, there are three regions. The region one is the salt state and two is the organogel state, which is the gel state and three is the zero gel state. 
these regions are demarcated by the change of slope. So I have uh, uh, demarcated them or marked them when I found the change of slope happened. Now in the first state, when I see the, uh, uh, the intensity in, increases from this point to this point, uh, and in this region, one in this step, actually this uh, siloxin bond uh, started forming the chain-like structure. And by, by this time, uh, all the chain actually got interconnected and formed a gel. And from this point on, onwards, uh, a, a gel uh, actually uh, start releasing its interstitial uh, solvent inside it. And the gel become started become very, very rigid uh, through this point to this point. And by the time it the gel reaches here, all the most of the solvent of the gel gets released and there is no more change of intensity with time here. That means uh, there is the gel uh, is compactly is uh, completely become a, a zero gel. Now, similar intensity profile pat pattern also observed for TOS uh, case where we have seen the gelation and the zero gelation happened quite earlier uh, in, uh, than the TE, TE, 22% uh, TEOS. So the point of taking two different uh, concentration was to see whether there is any effect of TEOS concentration on the gelation or zero gelation time or not. The lower plot on the left hand side, you could see, I wanted to uh, uh, show the same solution to zero relation kinetics to a structural uh, factor uh, study where uh, this G2T is called the correlation factor. And when a, a system is in liquid or solution state, this uh, correlation factor, the baseline of the correlation factor is actually re relaxes to zero from one. Now I have plotted here uh, a value which is called chi, which is called the, uh, the which is called the, the ergodicity breaking parameter, which is related to this G1 and G1 again related to G2 with this cigarette uh, relation. Now, at the solution state, this G1 at t equals to zero has the value of one, and and at t equals to in infinity for salt state, when the G2 relaxes to zero, it has a value of zero. So chi equals to one at the solution state uh, because it is one minus zero. So we can see we have plotted chi on the uh, right hand side y axis, we could see in the first step the chi is more or less close to one. That means it has the, I mean, the relation started and from this point, from the relation point, the chi value drastically decreases to this point and kept on decreasing till it becomes, uh, till it becomes zero zero. Now, similar pattern uh, has also been observed for the case of 30% uh, TEOS. And uh, again, the gelation and the zero gelation happened quite earlier. Now, the similar pattern or uh, sim similar phenomena was observed through rheological study. I will uh, uh, not go in much into this because I have to finish. So what I wanted to show here is that this is the storage modulus value and uh, uh, versus the frequency. Now, uh, I, in the D plot, I have plotted the low frequency storage modulus value in the Y axis and time in the X axis. We could see as the time passes by the G naught prime value kept on increasing till this point. That means the residue modulus, the gel became, uh, the gel uh, uh, actually become much or much stronger as it goes to gel to zero zero state once this point reaches the g naught prime became independent of the frequency the gel is no longer viscoelastic at the uh, zero zero phase moving on now what i wanted to show it by this 3d plot is that i have taken three different concentration and g naught prime the low frequency storage modulus is plotted in this axis and this is time and this in this axis i have, uh, I have kept the teos concentration 
So what I wanted to show uh, that is that as I uh, keep on increasing the concentration of TEOS, the the deletion uh, uh, the deletion and zero deletion time kept on decreasing. We could see black is for uh, twenty percent TEOS, and uh, this uh, from here to here that means from solution to gel state it takes uh, longer time. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the 30% TEOS case. Now I come to the part two study where I, I now I will incorporate the carbon dots inside this silica salt matrix. But first I have, I have to uh, synthesize and characterize the carbon dots. So this carbon dots was uh, synthesized in labs using a microwave pyrolysis method. And the TAME uh, study shows that uh, this uh, gray spots are actually carbon dots and they are uh, uh, closely spherical uh, and uniformly dispersed and the average size I got is 6.25 nanometer. The FDI study confirms that uh, it is uh, uh, confirms the formation of carbon dots uh, due to this signature peak at 6.25 which is a peak for CWO of the carboxyl group. The UV visible and the fluorescence study also uh, indicating the the proper formation of carbon dots now moving on after incorporation of the carbon dots what happens to this salt to gel and gel to zero gel phenomena now again i have uh, taken the dynamic slide scattering study and i have plotted the intensity profile and the chi the ergodicity parameter profile and it shows that the slope is much much higher than the then uh, the gel without the carbon dots. And what is noticeable here is that, that my, the, the deletion time after addition of the carbon dots drastically reduce uh, to 7.2 to 10 to the per three, which is close to two hours. So uh, I could re reduce the deletion time, which is usually two days to only uh, two hours after the addition of carbon dots. Similar uh, study uh, is shown through the uh, geological uh, point of view, where uh, the viscosity is plotted uh, through, uh, viscosity is, is plotted uh, with, with respect to shear rate and the storage modulus is plotted with, with respect to uh, 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 omega frequency of the shear where again, I showed uh, that the G prime value uh, increased. You could see the, uh, the data sets are here very less because I took much less time to take data because the gel was becoming, uh, the sol become gel very faster. That is why uh, I don't have much data in this region. As we can see the G prime value again increased. That means the gel state, when the gel state goes towards a zero gel state, the uh, the G naught prime value uh, increase the gel uh, become uh, gel becomes rigid with time till it 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 reaches the zero gel state, and uh, I'll, I have only two slides, ma'am. Uh, so in conclusion, I uh, uh, now I have a composite which is uh, more functional than the uh, pristine. Uh, silica after the addition of carbon dots because carbon dots has different groups on its surface carboxyl group and amine groups which can be further utilized for biomedical applications such as uh, drug delivery because our gel is fluorescent and I drastically I could uh, I, I, I have been able to reduce the gelation time and I could impart the fluorescent property inside the zero cell state. In, in the first, first slide I showed uh, uh, in the schematic diagram that uh, this is the gel. It is uh, a gel uh, a gel inside the apron drop, which is kept on a table. And you could see that the gel is in the lower part of this apron drop tube. And it is under the daylight uh, structure where we could see no flow. Fluorescent. When the, this tube is kept inside under uh, kept under UV excitation, the gel uh, fluoresces. Uh, it the fluorescence properties uh, came from the uh, fluorescence properties of the carbon dots. So, 
this is one a major conclusion and uh, thank you all it is uh, one of uh, it is from one of my published paper in my PhD duration. I want to thank my supervisors uh, then, back then. Right now, I want to thank my supervisor here in IIT Kharagpur and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shorkar. It was a very uh, nice and informative presentation. So uh, any questions from the uh, audience? Uh, students and other participants, if you want to ask anything. I think there will be no question. Uh, so uh, once again, I would like to thank you for uh, taking our time and uh, participating in this program. So I would uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Shuchandra Mukherjee. Uh, she is a research scholar at University of Calcutta. So, Shuchandra, uh, are you there? Shuchandra Mukherjee? Hello? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, you can share the screen and yes. start. Yes, it is visible. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, Suchandra, passing PhD under the supervision of Dr. Aurichu Banerjee. Uh, I am very much grateful to have this platform for delivering my talk on vacancy induced ultra low lattice thermal conductivity in PE vacant SB2 TH3. Uh, so, roadmap of my talk is introduction, synthesis, results and discussions, conclusion and acknowledgement. So, nowadays, due to excessive use of natural resource of fuel, the world is going to face energy crisis and uh, demands renewable energy sources. And here comes thermoelectric material. Uh, it can convert the wasted energy to electricity and uh, and for this it uh, can use in uh, various purposes as in automobile engineering and uh, for domestic appliances and uh, the basic physics uh, behind the thermoelectric material is very easy and based on the well known uh, Seebeck effect uh, Peltier effect and Thomson effect but the energy conversion is constrained via thermoelectric efficiency called ZT, figure of merit, which is designated as a square by rho kappa into T, where S is Seebeck coefficient, rho is electrical resistivity, kappa is thermal conductivity, and kappa consists of two parts, electronic parts and lattice parts. But the main bottleneck is S, rho, and kappa E are interrelated to each other via uh, in that is carrier concentration of the material and to optimize the zt value n uh, should be in between 10 to the power 19 to 10 to the power 20 which is uh, established by Snyder group so our central idea is to decouple the phonon and electronic part via maximizing the phonon scattering relative to charge carrier scattering which is uh, towards the lowering the kappa l and kappa L is the uh, only independent parameter. We chose uh, our system s 0 t 3 antimony telluride, which, is, uh, which gets very satisfactory thermoelectric performance at room temperature due to its uh, narrow band gap and its inherent defect. Its inherent defects are mainly two types, that is tellurium vacancy and SVTE and beside defects. Tellurium vacancy is created due to higher saturation vapor pressure of tellurium. And as tellurium evaporates, SV goes to tellurium sites. 
and creates native point defects. This is the schematic diagram of SVTE anticide defects. This is tellurium, uh, this is SB atom, and this is tellurium atom. When is, uh, tellurium atom evaporates, SB atom goes to tellurium site, and at, at each time, this anticide defect gives the system one hole. And that's why SB2TA3 is mainly in p-type in nature. So we want to tune the defects in the system. And that's why we have synthesized SB2T3 minus delta samples by taking stoichiometric amount of SB and T via and via solid state reaction method, we get SB2T3 minus delta samples. So at first, well, temperature dependent XRD was carried out using synchrotron facility uh, at uh, KEK Japan. And all the XRD data confirms that single phase nature of the samples. And uh, also, reed field refinement were carried out via mod software. And from reed field refinement, the temperature dependent lattice parameters and temperature dependent isotropic thermal factor were carried out. From temperature dependent lattice parameter, we can get the volume of the samples. And you can see that vol volume shrinkages with incorporation of tellurium vacuums. Where BIS, so that means the isotropic thermal factor is increasing with temperature for all the atomic position. And you can see that for all the atomic position, BIS value increases with tellurium vacancy. That proves the defects is increasing with tellurium vacancy. And the defects is uh, mainly anticide defects, SVT anticide defects. For further verification of, of phase, we have carried out the Raman spectroscopy measurement. And uh, from the room temperature Raman spectroscopy measurement, the single phase nature of all the samples are proved. And temperature dependent and power dependent Raman spectroscopic data. And from using this equation, we can estimate the thermal conductivity value from Raman. And uh, in this table, you can see that this is thermal conductivity uh, from PPMS data, and this is thermal conductivity for Raman data. And these two data are consistent and comparable also. And for, for further study, we have also uh, carried out temperature dependent specific data, and all the data are fitted with the well known T by equation. The well known D by equation, and from this equation, we can get the D by temperature for all the samples. And the D by temperature, you can see that the D by temperature is decreasing with increasing the incorporation of T vacancy. This is due to the increasing defects in uh, tellurium vacancy uh, SB2 TH system. So, for transport property measurement, at first we have carried out temperature dependent hall measurement. And from Hall coefficient, from uh, Hall coefficient data, you can see that all the samples are p-type in nature, and this is desirable that as defects are increasing, and uh, the, all the defects are at each time donates hole in the system, the NH is increasing with incorporation of p vacancy. But there is no such strong dependency of NH on temperature for all the samples. And this is the temperature dependent resistivity data. Resistivity is drastically decreased with increasing tellurium vacancy. This is consistent with the NH data. Now, all the temperature dependent resistivity data are fitted with well known equation. This where alpha p is uh, alpha p denotes the electron phonon scattering and beta p is electron electron scattering and theta relates to the phonon frequency. And you can see from the table that alpha p is uh, very, very greater than beta p. That means alpha, uh, electron phonon scattering dominates for all the system 
and electron-electron scattering is very low for all the systems. And you can estimate all. You can also estimate the phonon frequency from theta, and you can see that there is slight change in phonon frequency value for T for uh, T frequency incorporation. And uh, lastly, we have carried out temperature-dependent thermal conductivity data. So for thermal conductivity data, you can see that thermal conductivity drastically low for SB2 T 2.7, and this is beyond the error graph. And you can uh, see that for higher temperature regime, upwell varies with one by T, and this is due to the amplifier scattering. And amplifier scattering is higher in uh, SB2 T3 system and is lower than and is lower in SB2 T 2.7. That means in SB2 T 2.7, defect density is very much higher than Christian counterpart. So, so I want to conclude my slides that uh, we have synthesized all the samples via solid state reaction method. XRD was performed for phase purification. And for detailed structural characterization, we have performed reflect refinement uh, by MOD software. Raman spectroscopic study for phase, uh, for further phase verification was performed. And we have calculated lattice thermal conductivity for uh, from the temperature dependent and power dependent Raman spectroscopic study. We have also performed temperature dependent specific heat uh, measurement and uh, done the divide fitting and calculated the divide temperature. And we have performed career, temperature dependent carrier concentration and resistivity data, which are consistent with each other. And we have uh, showed that from temperature dependent so lattice thermal conductivity, we can get the ultra low kappa L for T deficit system. So I want to thank my supervisor, Dr. Aritra Banerjee, and my co supervisor, Dr. Shudipta Bandhubadhai, for their continuous support. And uh, my senior, I want to thank my senior, Dr. Shubarno Das, Dr. Pintu Singha, and my lab mate, Mr. Nabukumar Rana, for their continuous support. Thank you. Thank you, Shuchandra. Um, uh, I would uh, invite some questions, if there is any, from the audience. So uh, in the chat box, there is no question. If anyone wants to ask, um, they can unmute and ask. I think there is no question. So thank you, uh, Ms. Chandra Mukherjee, for your uh, nice thank presentation. You. And thank then I would so uh, like to move on to the uh, next um, uh, speaker. So I would like to invite uh, Onkur Jyoti Kalita from KU Leuven. Uh, so uh, are you there? Um, yeah. Do, do you hear me? Yes, you're on. So you right. can share your screen and start. Yeah. I think you are not audible. Uh, you are. Uh, yeah. So when I uh, tried to like share the screen, and I just automatically got uh, muted. No I'll problem. You can again. share again and start. Yeah. You are muted again. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, so I don't seem to um, like unmute myself when I share my screen. 
for some reason. Uh, if you um, uh, bring your cursor down to your screen, you'll get the uh, bar. Yeah, but it doesn't. Uh, okay, let's let's see if I can do it. Do you see it now? And do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, but okay. your presentation, yes. Yeah, I can see now. Now do you see it? Okay. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so sorry for that. Um, and uh, hello everyone. I'm Ankur, and uh, I'm currently a master's student at the uh, um, astronomy uh, department in Kyiv. And today I'm going to talk about this project that I've been uh, doing lately. Uh, so this project uh, basically revolves around the question of planet formation and the observational imprints that the uh, planet formation process can induce on its host star. Um, so there's a general consensus on the fact that the planet occurrence rate uh, actually correlates with the metallicity of the host star. Um, and uh, wh well, whether the metallicity is primordial or whether it is caused by the process of star, for, uh, sorry, planet formation itself is not uh, yet very clear to us. So people are also trying to see in what other way the planet formation can leave a mark on the chemical abundances of its host star, and uh, which might then lead us to a better understanding of the complex processes that are involved with planet formation itself. So um, one such idea uh, comes from this paper uh, by Melendez, uh, where they suggested that the formation of terrestrial planet can induce a refractory depletion on its host star. And uh, how does it do so is that if you're forming a terrestrial planet, like um, rocky bodies like Earth, you can trap a lot of dust from the circumstellar disk around the star, which then leads to the depletion of these um, elements on the host star. So what you then would expect is a specific trend of uh, abundance patterns on the star um, to the different condensation temperatures of those elements. But uh, there's also an alternative theory uh, where you can form a giant planet close to the star and that can create a gap in the circumstellar disk. And that would eventually prevent the outer dusty material to be to, to fall onto the star. So uh, you can induce a similar abundance pattern um, um, from this process as well. What you would see observationally um, <clears throat> is a correlation between condensation temperature and the abundance of its host star. So in this figure, uh, you see HIP2962 is a planet host. And HIP2961 is a companion star to the system. And you clearly see that the planet hosting star has lower amount of refractory elements compared to the one that doesn't have a planet. Um, however, to like start this uh, analysis from a single star point of view, this is observationally not so easy to do. And there are just too many things that can go wrong and too many complications, so to speak. Uh, one of such problems is that the fact that the star might accrete the inner planetary material after the planet formation happens. So which can then pollute the abundance patterns and um, erase away any signals that the planet formation process itself would have induced on the chemical uh, abundances of uh, the star. Uh, having a history of dynamical interactions uh, between the star and the planet also doesn't help. And um, naturally, the chemical abundances are correlated to the birth region of the star and their ages. So if you're trying to compare different single stars from different places, uh, different birthplaces, um, you're naturally um, plagued by all these factors. What you can do better is to use binary systems where one star is a planet host, while the other doesn't have any planet around it. And it helps in the sense that binaries are evolved from the same molecular cloud. So they have the same chemical composition and they share a similar age. So some of these problems that you would encounter with a single star would already be gone. Um, this was indeed our uh, idea uh, behind this project is to use binary stars to compare their stellar abundances and see if the star with the planet and the 
uh, and the one without the planet are indeed different uh, in, in terms of chemical abundances. So we made a proposal to observe uh, two sets of binary stars at the Mercator telescope in La Palma uh, during October last uh, year. And um, well, however, the, the weather condition is uh, not really favorable to us. So we couldn't really observe one of our systems and we we basically made a choice to just focus on one system and uh, gather high signal to noise for one system rather than focusing on two and just do both half cooked. Um, and um, the system we observed, uh, the uh, BD plus 374734, it has a primary F9 type star and G0 type secondary star. And the secondary star has a uh, Jupiter-like planet around it. Once we obtain the spectra, uh, some of the basic pre-processing were to do a radial velocity corrections, um, which we do by cross-correlating one epoch, uh, we'll just take a random epoch and then cross-correlating uh, all the other epochs of this star, uh, spectra uh, with it. And then by stacking them all together to increase the signal to noise. And we then identified uh, the uh, elements that we would use um, in our analysis, uh, different elements in different wavelengths, and just make a line list, and also measured the uh, equivalent widths of the uh, lines by just fitting a Gaussian profile <clears throat> to do the uh, spec spectral uh, profile. Um, what we then do is to fit a grid of models uh, for uh, atmospheres. Uh, well, models of atmosphere of the star and uh, to the to the spectra, and uh, the idea was to obtain uh, stellar parameters uh, uh, for both of the stars. But then we also uh, do use this uh, atmospheric analysis called MOOC to uh, fit the stellar parameter once again. So the idea was to uh, use a very small grid of model atmosphere uh, to fit the spectra <coughs> first because that uh, process is a sort of um, computationally expensive. So then we would get a initial guess value, which is a, a good guess, uh, so to speak. And that guess we use in MOOC to uh, fit the stellar parameter again. How uh, it's done in MOOC is that uh, we try to minimize the slope of the iron abundance with respect to the excitation potential and different wavelengths of different iron lines that we use. And the idea here is that the iron abundance uh, calculated from different excitation level or different lines in the same star should be the same. So the slope in ideal case uh, should be zero. Now, uh, this allows uh, to finally fix the star parameter of our system. And uh, here you can see just a table uh, mentioning all the important star parameters that we would need uh, for the next uh, step of this analysis. Once we fix our star parameters, uh, we can just compute uh, the abundances of the elements using the line list and the equivalent widths uh, that I already mentioned. Uh, this is also sort of an iterative process where MOOC just uh, iterates over a grid of abundances and then compare the equivalent widths that we com it computed from the observed spectra to the equivalent widths of the models that it generates and then just minimizing the chi-square error. First of all, uh, let's look at the differential abundance uh, for both of the stars with respect to the sun. Here you already see that the primary here, which we call BD3 plus 374738348A, uh, and the secondary we call it B. Yeah? Um, you see that the primary is very similar to the, star, uh, to the sun because these are differential abundances. Um, however, uh, you see maybe the uh, primary is slightly metal core. Um, but following this interpretation from Melendez, uh, what it would suggest then that, uh, that, that the primary would uh, also contain uh, terrestrial planets because, well, sun contains terrestrial planets, right? So um, if the primary is the same, is very similar to the sun, you would also expect um, 
the primary uh, star here to contain uh, terrestrial planets, but we don't have any such uh, report of uh, <clears throat> detection of uh, terrestrial planet around the primary. If you focus on the secondary, we see a clear positive slope. And this is very similar to the average uh, of solar twins relative to the sun. And this is also consistent with the idea that uh, formation of closing giant planets prevent the formation of terrestrial planets. So uh, since the secondary also has a uh, Jupiter-like one and it's very close to the star. So what might have happened in this case um, is that the formation of that uh, closing Jupiter-like planet uh, prevented the formation of Earth-like planet around the, um, around the secondary. However, uh, if you look at the uh, differential abundance between the two stars in the binary, we see that the um, secondary is slightly metal rich compared to the primary and also have slightly more um, abundances of refractory elements. Um, this is in contrary to the hypothesis that Jupiter uh, like planet induces a refractory depletion on the host star, the, the hypothesis that I already uh, mentioned before. So, what could have gone wrong in our system? Well, um, one of the possible explanations could be planet engulfment. The idea of planet engulfment is such that the star literally just uh, engulf or eat planetesimals and small rocky bodies, which would have locked the uh, refractory elements. And the giant planet actually forms outward on the circumstellar disk. And then at some point it migrated inward. And during that migration process of the giant planet in the secondary uh, star, it, uh, it the, the inner rocky bodies also migrated towards the star and finally ended up inside the star. And that would have uh, increased the um, uh, refractory element abundance of the secondary. We should, uh, however, note that the um, turbulence in molecular clouds can also induce such a chemical pattern. Um, but given the separation between the two stars in our system is around 130 astronomical units, we can perhaps discard this idea that the turbulence would um, um, cause the um, abundance uh, differences that we see in the, in the system. One of the immediate uh, future improvements to our results would be, well, because these are just initial results from our um, project, um, one of the future improvements would be to correct for the atomic diffusion, which can also alter the surface abundance of a star, but uh, otherwise um, our system is a very good potential um, planet engulfment candidate. What we can do better though is, the, is to obtain more high signal to noise ratio because you might have seen here that the error bars in our abundances are very high. Um, but that, is, that was all we could do with um, the quality of the data we had. But uh, it would be nice to do some sort of a follow-up uh, to this work uh, with better signal to noise or just obtain just more spectra and then we can just stack it and then get better signal to noise, um, which might also allow us to uh, put tighter constraints on some of these conclusions we have. And that might lead us to a, be a better understanding of this system uh, in particular. Right, so that's it from my side. Um, Thank you for listening and I'll take questions now if you have any. Thank you, Ankur. It was a really nice and interesting presentation. So I think there will be questions from the students. Hello. Hey, yes. yeah, Ankur, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, very nice talk. So uh, just one quick, quick question. So you have talked about some metallicity, metal rich star, metal poor stars. Yeah. So I want to know what kind of stars generally form planets or is there any criteria to uh, set metallicity value that should be necessary for planet formation? Most of the planets is, that is we there, uh, is there any cutoff around, value of metallicity? Um, in stars uh, that should be necessary for planet formation. 
Yeah, so it's usually, um, also this is probably a demographic bias, but we see most of our exoplanets is around the sun-like stars or lower in temperature, because okay. that would uh, mean that uh, you condense, uh, so your dust condensation would happen uh, close to the star if the temperature of the star is uh, lower. So that would help to form the star. Uh, if you have a very uh, high mass stars, you have very high stellar winds and so on. So that doesn't really help in uh, dust condensation and uh, the further formation of these planetesimals. And also, but uh, as I said, this might be a, a demographic bias because people uh, just sell this idea, <laughs> to be honest, that uh, ah, we're going to look for exoplanets or uh, life in other um, extraterrestrial life and so on. So this might be a detection bias as well, because we're just looking for them. We're not really interested in planets that are around the high mass stars and so on. But usually high mass stars, it's very hard to form planets. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, and there's another question from Vansh Vatra. Uh, so uh, he wants to know, would there be any specific residue in planet engulfment? Or maybe any possible um, way to just narrow it down um, of our data? Narrow it out of our data, like. Okay, um, I don't uh, know. What do you mean by narrowing it down? Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, but, yeah, so a specific residue in planet engulfment. Well, uh, that depends on what kind of um, planet you're eating, basically. But uh, usually, it's the terrestrial planets. And uh, well, if you eat terrestrial planets, you expect you have more refractory elements. Well, that's the idea that we're going for as well. Um, and it's hard to just uh, eat uh, Jupiter-like planet and not see the difference, so, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, any more questions? Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, I want to know, it's not a question, what do you mean by solar abundances? Well, uh, so, this is a... Um, term that we always use in astronomy. It's just the um, metal abundances of, uh, well, also by metal, we mean everything other than hydrogen and helium. And um, it's just the abundances of different elements in uh, solar like or in our sun compared to the hydrogen uh, content of our sun. So it's just that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any more questions? Okay, so thank you, um, Ankur. This was a really nice and interesting uh, presentation. I would uh, like to move on to the next presentation uh, presenter now. So I would like to invite uh, Dishani Mitra from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata to present. So Dishani, are you here? Yeah, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You can share the screen and start. Can you all see my screen? Yes, your screen is visible. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the work that we are doing, which is for investigation of an old open cluster, but we can see. And thank you to the organizing team of uh, Adamus University for like inviting me to present my work. So, so I'm going to start with the introduction and why we are choosing Berkeley Classic Open Cluster methodology, the data is used, the membership probability, the proper motion analysis, the video density profile, reddening and isotonification of the last two So I'm going to start with introduction. So what are stars and stars clusters? So, group of stars which are fairly closer and travel together. These are, and there are three types of star clusters. Those are globular star clusters and galaxy or open star clusters and OB associates. But here we will focus on open clusters. 
So why we are focusing on birthday 26 so much last year? As birthday 26 is a very old and thorough study of Crossfield, and which is placed in one of the rest, and uh, it has a very high red gain, which may, makes it more challenging to study. And the research on Berkeley 26 has provided many insights into the formation and evolution of working clusters and uh, our broader context of form galaxy evolution, we can also see from Berkeley 26. Moving on to methodology. So first I will talk about uh, how I, we got membership probability analysis. So first we use the data from the multi-dimension Gaia dr 3 data. Uh, which is uh, just uh, released on 13th June 2022. And uh, we have used uh, this data for a small number analysis of our cluster of 26. And uh, we, are, we have taken the G92 to 2092. And we have also used two months data. And the membership probability. So here, uh, open clusters are located within the densely populated galactic plane and contaminated by a large number of background stars. So it is necessary to differentiate between cluster members and non-members. So here the, the membership estimate criteria, as you can see for the, in the left-hand side, upper left uh, for the cluster of 26, so for the cluster uh, and clean star distribution, two different distribution functions, phi C mu and uh, phi F mu are constructed for a particular i star. The values of frequency distribution function are given as follows. And the plot in the left-hand side is the membership probability plot of Berkeley 26, which is plotted from G92 versus membership probability. And here, we matched our likely members with this catalog, having membership probability higher than 80%. So, uh, and it was considered with G magnitude up to 20 magnitude. So we um, considered the normalized number of cluster members, stars and field stars, which is denoted by NC and MF in the right hand side, the formula of phi equal to NC into phi C mu plus NF into phi, phi F mu, where NC and MF are the normalized number of cluster stars and field stars. So the total uh, distribution function can be calculated as this. As a result, the membership probability for the i stars is given by p mu i, where phi c is uh, for cluster members and phi is the total cluster. And the right hand side picture denotes the entire uh, RN declination plot and uh, G versus uh, the column magnitude diagram for Berkeley 26 and the proper motion distribution for Berkeley 26. So moving on to uh, this uh, column magnitude diagram for our cluster members that we got. So for all clusters, we have plotted G versus G, DP, and G minus GRP. And the identification chart and the problem motion distribution using this, and uh, we, as we got the uh, membership probability higher than 80%, so this is our cluster member diagram. Moving on to the RA uh, definition and problem motion analysis. Uh, this is the parallax versus V magnitude plot for Berkeley 26 uh, with cluster members left inside. The, and we are, are, as we are having probability above 80%, so field stars are denoted as a black line V, and the red are denoted as cluster members. And here, the vector point diagram, as you all can see, is a plot of PMRA versus PM declination, where each star is a cluster is represented as a point. Uh, it has been identified cluster member in many previous existing studies using all stars as the field and cluster star. This is the histogram analysis of uh, PMRA versus count and the PM declination. Moving on to radial density profile. So we have uh, plotted radial density profile using King's profile fitting. So here in the uh, RN definition figure where the cluster stars are evidently seen as marked in the blue circle. And here, the, take, after taking the membership probability, as we can clearly see, the cluster members are highlighted in the red. So, this formula where FR equal to FD plus F0 by 1 plus R by RC whole square, where RC is the core radius, 
F0. F0 is the central density and FBG is the background density. So in right hand side, we have plotted the pins profile fitting. Um, this, uh, as in this figure, we can see a coronal bump is present. This is unusual because uh, we think there is a, there, as there is a binary cluster near to bucket 26, there is a nearby cluster bucket 27. So this coronal bump takes place. So it is really unusual result that we are getting. Moving on to interstellar reddening. So interstellar reddening is uh, we plotted uh, this uh, J minus K uh, versus J minus H plot. And here uh, the ratio of the uh, E j minus k, j minus h, uh, e j minus k shows a good agreement with the normal value of 0.5 according to the literature proposed by Cardinal. Uh, and uh, this solid line that we're seeing is the uh, cluster 0, 8 main sequence dams taken from Cadwell data, 1993. And uh, we uh, plotted this uh, diagram using this formula, e g a g minus h equal to 0 0.20 into 3 minus minus b. And e g minus k equal to 0.48 into b minus b. So moving on to isochron fitting. So isochron fitting we estimated uh, according to the literature on, given in the vector page for the open class of Berkeley 26, uh, that their log age is nearly 9.6 and uh, their uh, metallicity is minus 0 0.7. So uh, we fitted the theoretical isochrons of different ages using. Uh, Comparison with parsec isochron model of log age uh, 9.65, 9.55, 9.45. .5. In all the uh, color magnitude diagram for, for the open cluster block 26 is shown in the right hand side figure. And from this figure, we can say that best global space is available for the middle isochron of log age 9.55 to the high mass cluster members. And here in this plot, as you can see, this. Um, Blue dotted stars can be called as blue stagger stars. So, moving on to the conclusions, uh, Berkeley 26 is really a very poorly studied cluster and it has a distant nearby cluster due to which uh, we have taken a search radius of 10 arc minutes. And uh, Berkeley 26, uh, as it is a very old cluster and uh, very poor, so the results we are obtained as far is very, quite interesting. We are further investigating new methods to get better results. And I want to thank uh, my supervisor, Ashish Raj, uh, and uh, Devan Ravish uh, for the guidance and encouragement. And I want to thank my teammate, uh, Vishnu Deruka, who also uh, equally uh, we both work together on this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a nice presentation. Uh, again, if <clears throat> there is any question. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah. So nice work. So uh, I just want to ask you what's exactly mean by 5C. Could you please explain a bit? 5C. Yeah, 5C. Yeah, 5C is a function of the cluster. Like yes. Yeah. So what it is exactly yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. According to the membership probability, uh, are you talking about this uh, formula? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 You're right. Phi C is the function for cluster members of those stars. And okay, so, so that, yeah. So we are we have used the Gaussian mixture model method to detect it. So. Okay, because I'm not from uh, like a star background. So I was interested in like what's exactly meant by this thing. And because you have uh, shown the uh, formula of I C there. So I think it's probability formula. If I'm not yeah, Phi C is for cluster members. So That's there right. are two types of um, yeah, sphere star and cluster stars. So Phi C is for cluster stars. But this is a basic formula that we have to just use for membership probability. Find out the membership probability of any clusters and other global clusters as well, open clusters. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, so hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah, this only, uh, what is the location of this uh, cluster in Milky Way Galaxy? What is the location of this object? 
तो इस दिस क्लस्टर इज लोकेटेड इन अराउंड द गैलेक्टिक डिस्क और फार अवे फ्रॉम गैलेक्टिक डिस्क फार अवे फ्रॉम गैलेक्टिक सो डिड यू चेक द डिस्टेंस ऑफ ऑफ दिस क्लस्टर फ्रॉम द डिस्क या ओके एंड यू आर आल्सो शोइंग सम ब्लू स्ट्रगलर स्टार्स इन योर कलर मैग्नीट्यूड डायग्राम सो डिड यू चेक देयर the radial distribution how those stars distributed in your field no but uh, as uh, above yeah. 16 magnitude uh, we can see that we can say that this so I, I mean i mean those stars are centrally concentrated or they are lying just uh, outskirts of this object outskirts of this object okay so what should be the main cause for uh, bss formation in this object so is there any maybe region because, any possible region yeah, maybe because there is a binary cluster nearby okay cluster yeah this berkeley 26 has a nearby binary cluster berkeley 27 so maybe okay. this is uh, bss yeah you you can also you can also check the binary content in your cluster that uh, that this picture will very clear after that so those uh, bss which are appearing in your color magnitude diagram and in your field so they may be because of binarity as you are explaining and uh, one more question uh, in your radial density profile uh, you have also mentioned that point uh, a sudden jump is around 5 uh, arc minutes so why it is um we think that uh, maybe due to that reason that uh, because of uh, the nearby lan rain cluster is there just still figuring out that is okay. a like, coronal jump as the membership of that cluster is also coincided coinciding with our berkeley 26 which is near by cluster which is berkeley so, 26 so yeah let, let, let me explain actually in uh, case of blue struggle the stars they generally uh, found in just above the turnoff point normally stars spend most of their life as a main sequence stars as you can see in disani's uh, color magnitude diagram but uh, when uh, in the in the main sequence uh, actually nuclear fusion going on at the core like our sun hydrogen crunch into the helium but when all the hydrogen is used up then it start it start to leap from the main sequence so that is the turn off point and the location of blue struggle stars are just above the turn off point that's why those bss stars can't follow the path of uh, isochrome okay uh, so i the, this question was from kuldeep i think uh, uh, yeah, your answer you got the answer so thank you uh, dishani and thank you sir thank for you all for giving me the opportunity to present my work yes uh, so next i would um, request um, our coach dr deepta shikha dash to take over from here um thank you dr bishash so next speaker uh, in this session is uh, mr debesh bhattacharji from aizer pune he will be talking on uh, turbulence and anomalous resistivity inside near earth magnetic clouds uh, so over to you debesh thank you ma'am <clears throat> for the nice introduction yeah so i'm sharing my screen hope it will work uh okay so why this is so all of you can hear me yes you are audible and audible. you can see me right like my screen yeah 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 okay good good to go yeah so uh i'm going to speak about uh one part of my phd so this is all about sun so i am from a like solar physics or heliophysics background and i think i am the first one uh, until now to present on this particular topic about sun so let's begin so before moving into uh, my work which is all about fluctuations and anomalous 
activity inside near earth magnetic clouds so let me brief through what are magnetic clouds and what is a cme because it's connected to the cmes so let's begin what is happening yeah so yeah so coronal mass ejections or in short cmes are massive blobs of plasma as you can see from this picture right so now you are wondering that what it is this picture what is this picture right so this picture so so corona first let me uh, speak about corona corona is the outermost part of the sun which normally we cannot see because it's very faint in visible spectra so we need to occult the bright photosphere of the sun right so when we can see uh, corona in eclipse okay so in eclipse you can see the corona which is the outermost part so what we do to observe the corona is to uh, make an artificial eclipse so that we can occult it so this particular image is of a corona graph which is an artificial solar eclipse which actually occults the photosphere and the chromosphere of the sun so that we can clearly observe the corona this is the corona so this white circle is the sun the diameter of the sun as you can see and this is the occult so as you can see that from the corona which is very very hot you can see that there is a huge blob and this is huge in the sense this is the size of the sun and this is the size of the cm so this is actually huge so you can see that this huge blob of plasma is emitting is emitting out of the sun right so it starts from here and then it expands and evolves in the interplanetary space so and you can also see these things these these, these small like fiber like things these are basically magnetic fields so normally you cannot see magnetic field lines but here you can see because these magnetic field lines are really at attached with the plasma uh, so it follows the plasma is uh, like the, the they follow the particles follow the magnetic field so you can see this okay so this is the coronal mass ejection from the corona graph observation so let's move so this is our good old picture from our last slide so now since we have a bit of understanding about cmes so now when it when these cmes go and move through the inter interplanetary space so all these parts as you can see there is a like a cavity like structure and all these things they are merged they are merged with each other and form a cloud like structure so this is this is not an observation this is an artist impression so but this actually if you if you see this from the sun uh, when it goes so it actually looks like a cloud and so this is the cloud and as you know that the magnetic field lines are closed so the clouds the end point of the clouds are connected with the sun so that's why this connection okay okay good so and inside the cloud you can see there is a like spiral like wrapped up thing so this is the magnetic field so all these magnetic fields are wrapped up with either each other to form this magnetic cloud so this thing is called the magnetic cloud now in this particular work i am going to speak about the in situ observation so what is a in situ observation in situ observation so uh, okay so first of all uh, this cme is huge and this magnetic cloud is even even like more more huge because it has like it is traveling through the interplanetary space and as well as in expanding so it is huge so now you have a spacecraft which is like a dot <clears throat> situated somewhere in the space for me for my case it is at l1 lagrangian one point and this entire big thing this 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 giant monster is traveling through it so what it is doing it is measuring all the information like magnetic field density and all these other things through this line so basically it is gathering information along the cross section of the magnetic cloud okay now how the data of the in situ observation looks like so this is again our good old picture from the last slide so that you can see you can connect this is the spacecraft passage and what you can see that so these are the data like magnetic field the rotation of the magnetic field so this is bx by and bz this is with respect to the uh, gac geo uh, geocentric spherical eclectic so this is called this is the coordinate system which we use this is np and this is plasma beta so plasma beta is the ratio between the gas pressure and the magnetic pressure so to you see that inside the magnetic cloud so this boundary as you can see that this boundary is signifies the magnetic cloud the width of the magnetic cloud so inside the magnetic cloud the magnetic field actually enhances 
you have seen or you can also see here that the magnetic field actually wraps around the center of the cloud and this is evident from this rotation of the magnetic field lines like bx by and bz all these components are rotating right and then you have this np which is low and plasma beta is low because the magnetic pressure is high inside the magnetic cloud that is basically the driving point it is expanding now the question is why why we are so much interested in magnetic clouds and all the CMEs? This is because CMEs are the primary drivers of the something called space weather impacts. So do you remember a few years back, Elon Musk, uh, the SpaceX mission, they have lost 40 satellites and it, it, it costs like millions of dollars, but that's because of the CME. A CME hit Earth and because of its strong magnetic fields and very like high energetic particles, SpaceX lost 40 satellites and it can also happen again, right? So the CMEs can affect everything, like everything which has a charged particle in it, starting from the satellite to the astronaut safety, to the avionics, to the electrical power grids, to communication system, radio and everything. That's why we need to keep an eye on CMEs and we need to probe its characteristics. Okay, so now coming to the roadmap, coming to my particular work, which is all about fluctuations inside near earth MCs. MC means magnetic clouds, not anything else. And then the anomalous resistivity, second part, I will speak about it. So let's begin with the turbulent fluctuations in, NC, uh, in near earth MCs. So in this particular work, I'm gonna speak about three type of fluctuations. One is the delta NP over NP, then P over P, and then finally the Mach number fluctuations this is the acoustic Mach number fluctuations. So to estimate all these fluctuations, I need to set a window, window of time. So for that, I have chosen two windows. One is the 40 minute windows, another one is one hour or 60 minute windows. So all these things you see this NP, B and CS. CS is the sound speed, by the way. So NP, B and CS. So these are basically the running mean. Uh, so you have, uh, I have shown you the in situ observation, the data, right? This is with respect to time, the X axis, right? So there you can find out the running mean inside this particular box. So the, the, these, these box actually do slide and you can compute the running mean. And then you have this RMS fluctuations, which is all these things, Delta NP, B and M, all these are RMS fluctuations on top of it. So that we can find out the fluctuations, the modulation indices, these are called the modulation indices. Now we have 152 well, well observed events from wind spacecraft. So wind is a spacecraft by NASA. It's at L1 point and we can probe. So directly jumping into the results, skipping all the details in between. So what you can see here. So by the way, this is a statistical analysis. The whole paper is on this because we have a large number of events. Uh, anyway, so this is the histogram. There are two histograms here, you can see. So the first histogram, which is the yellow one, there you can see that the NP fluctuations inside magnetic cloud, and the other one is NP, uh, sorry, B fluctuations inside magnetic cloud. So what you can see, which is very evident, the first thing you see is that the NP fluctuations are higher compared to the B fluctuations inside the magnetic cloud. Now, why it is that? This is because the magnetic field fluctuations are probably associated with magnetosonic modes. Now, you might wonder what is a magnetosonic mode. So just like in a normal medium, we have a characteristic speed called sound speed in a plasma, because all these things I'm speaking about plasma only. So in plasma, we have four, magneto, four characteristic speeds. One is obviously sound speed. The other one is Alvin speed, which only deals about magnetic fields. The other two are called the magnetosonic mode. So fast mode and the slow mode. So there you have the sonic part as well as the magnetic part. The fluctuations are in both. So previously it, it has been thought that uh, delta B, the magnetic field fluctuations are only associated with Alvin modes, but we have shown that no, this that's not true because there is a fluctuations in NP and which means that the, the uh, magnetic clouds are M, uh, CMEs are basically compressible object and the, that compressibility can tie it up with the magnetic field to make a magnetosonic approach. Okay. 
Now for the second result, okay, I have not uh, shown here the background. So BG means background. So what is a background? Background is a quiescent solar wind or unperturbed solar wind. So this I have not shown uh, the, like the results, but you can count on my words for now. So what you have seen, what you will see that the NP fluctuations inside the magnetic cloud are higher compared to in the background. And for magnetic uh, field fluctuations for B, it's just the opposite. Now, why it is that? So the second, so the first result says that the, in, uh, the magnetic clouds are basically compressible. And the second result shows that it is magnetically incompressible because the fluctuations are less inside magnetic clouds. This means that it can retain its, its structure because as you, uh, as you have seen in my previous slides that the, the, the skeleton is the magnetic field. So it can retain its structure inside the magnetic field in a form of the magnetic field. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, the second part of my this project is that I'm just wondering that are the velocity fluctuations inside or in the boundary of the magnetic clouds are subsonic or supersonic. So for that, we have this delta M, which is the Mach number, acoustic Mach number fluctuations, where CS is the sound speed. Now you might wonder that why, why I'm like interested in this thing. The reason is there is a, there is a thing called a drag law. You might have known about the Stokes law in your school days that there is something called Stokes law uh, regarding drag, aerodynamic drag. So there is something similar in this case also for a plasma when a, when a CME, which is propagating through the uh, solar wind, it is actually supersonically propagating because CMEs are very fast. Okay, ICME means interplanetary coronal mass ejection. So CMEs are very fast. And because of that, uh, what happens is that they, they, they drive a shock. Now this particular, this particular formula, look at my cursor, this particular formula where it, FD is the drag force, this is a subsonic law. However, it has been successfully used by a lot of researchers in describing the dynamics of ICMEs or magnetic clouds. This is the catch, why a subsonic drag law is so much successfully useful or used by a lot of community and it actually reproduce the results. So why, why is this? Why a subsonic drag law is useful for a supersonic ICME? So there is a hypothesis called Morokovin's hypothesis, which says that if, if a body is supersonically moving through a high Reynolds number flow, and if the fluctuations in the boundary of that body is subsonic in nature, the, if the velocity fluctuations, then one can use the subsonic drag law for object which is supersonically moving through the high Reynolds number flow. So we want to verify that. And we did. What we have found, mm. we have found. Sorry to interrupt you, yes. uh, Debesh. Actually, you have another uh, two to three minutes to uh, actually wrap up your presentation. Okay. That's okay. why. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. I will wrap up. Yeah. So what we have found that indeed the acoustic Mach number fluctuations are subsonic inside and in the boundary of the magnetic cloud. And this says that though the ICM is propagated supersonically through the solar wind, but the fluctuations inside and in the boundaries are subsonic. So th this somehow says that this is, this actually satisfies the Morokovin's hypothesis. And this somehow says that this is the probably, this is the reason behind the fact that uh, the subsonic drag law is useful for a supersonic object. Now coming to the last part of my, this talk, which is all about collisions. Now collisions, so we have plasma, we are dealing with plasma. So we have charged particles. So you all know that the charged particles in a very base level, they interact via Coulomb collisions, right? Now inside the magnetic cloud, since it is very huge, is huge and this volume is big, the number of charged particles is very low. So the, so the, so the mean free path is very large for a normal Coulomb collisions inside the magnetic cloud. For that reason, the collisions are very infrequent inside magnetic cloud. Now for the, for the case, look at the second picture. Now we have seen that there is a magnetic field fluctuations, right? Now, if a particle is very much tied to the magnetic field and if 
the magnetic field has fluctuations like this. So the particle will go like this and scatter from here, then again go like this and scatter from here and simultaneously it will go and scatter from all these kinks in the magnetic field fluctuations, right? This will shorten the mean free path and because of the shortening of the mean free path, the resistivity will enhance. Okay, so this, this particular case, the second case is called the anomalous resistivity or non-spitzer resistivity. Yeah, so why I'm interested in calculating this non-spitzer resistivity because the spitzer resistivity for joule heating rate is very small, very low for magnetic cloud. So it cannot account for the heating of the ICME. So heating of the ICME is a big mystery, just like the heating of the solar corona. So that's why we come into the non-spitzer or anomalous resistivity. So as you have, as I have mentioned that the non-spitzer means that the charged particles are stochastically scattering from the all the magnetic kinks around the magnetic field fluctuations. Okay. So Ibish, now actually to, your time is already over. Okay, to try try to wrap up. Okay. 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 Yeah. Mm. Already over. Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm. Yeah. So what we have found that the Anomalous resistivity is much higher compared to the speed cell resistivity inside the magnetic cloud. And in the background, this is not the case. So inside the magnetic cloud, the non speed cell, the non speed cell resistivity actually can supplement to the joule heating. And because of the time, I am just skipping this thing. So this is all I have told you. And this is, I am from ISA Pune. And this, these are my uh, organizers. And finally, this is the reference paper. and. Thank you. Yeah, I'm done. Uh, thank you, Devesh, for your nice presentation. So uh, actually, there is no question in chat section. So anyone want to ask anything uh, from Devesh? Want to ask here directly? Is there Hello. any question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Devesh. Nice talk. Thank you. So uh, I, I want to just... Uh, I want to ask just uh, what is the duration of uh, coronal mass ejection, the normal duration, and is there any connection between uh, coronal mass ejection and the sun's halo? Sun's halo? Yeah. No. So the first first thing is that coronal mass ejections uh, take almost like one or two days to reach Earth. Duration okay. means this is since this is a blob of plasma, so it will okay. it will start from the sun and it will end at the end of the heliosphere okay that's 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 very far from pluto and oort cloud okay. so it will it will traverse and finally it will mix with the solar wind so because it expands and then finally it will get mixed uh, regarding the sun cell no it has no connection with the sun cell it's basically the thing is that all the coronal so this has connection with sun spots actually so okay. because of the sunspots, the uh, activity of the sunspots in the active So sun you mean so CMEs is connected with sun spot? Ah, uh, yeah. Like it has it has also connection with a, a lot of other things, but yeah, it is connected okay. with the sunspots, yes. The motion okay. of the sunspots. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, one question uh, from the chat box uh, from Priyanka Banerjee. Which instruments are used for looking collision in sun? Collision inside sun? Yes, you... question is written there. Do you mean inside sun? Covenant. Collision in sun. Yes, sir. She is Achha. saying yes, sir. Collision? No, you cannot probe collision inside sun. So there is something called uh, helioseismology. So, because you 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 have you might have heard about Parker Solar Probe, which is the uh, which which launched just two years back, for no actually four years back. So that is the only one uh, spacecraft which actually went to almost like zero point two uh, AU. AU is the gap between Sun and Earth. And to look into the collisions inside Sun, you need to simulate. You need to rely on computations because. Uh, you can you can probe it via waves because helioseismology is like earth seismology like you can probe inside earth's crust using the waves of earthquake in the similar way you can probe through uh, the sun all the layers of the sun and this is the way we know about the sun's layers like there is a core there is a uh, like radiation zone 
corona, not corona, uh, chromosphere and all this stuff. So this is the way, like in, in helioseismology, you actually probe through waves, not through particle collisions. Okay, uh, uh, Komulika Hajra have, uh, yes, Komulika Hajra, okay, uh, raised her hand. So she want to ask any question? Sure. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Uh, you are audible, you are audible, yeah. Devesh, I uh, actually teach uh, quantum physics in the undergraduate level, and we have a part in the course where we have to teach Zeeman effect. Now, in mm -hmm. the applications of Zeeman effect, when I was teaching the students, I found that uh, uh, it was said that uh, sunspots and the magnetic field in sunspots can be um, can be estimated using the Zeeman effect. Uh, can you throw light on this in brief? How it is done? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you for the question. Yes, uh, using Zeeman effect, you can like very like Zeeman effect is the base level to identify sunspots because uh, sunspots always form in pairs. So, okay, so our Earth is a bipolar object, right? But Sun is a multipolar object. So, for each sunspot, we have either a north pole and a south pole. Not north south, it's a kind of plus minus pole. So that's why uh, if you if you like use Zeeman effect. Uh, to probe the sun's photosphere, you will find that uh, so uh, one one of the like uh, some of the sunspots are basically uh, like white and some of them are black. So white and black means uh, white and black are codes or color codes which is used in magnetograms to see like whites are the spots where the field is coming uh, from the sun in the corona and for the black it is going into the sun. So in this way, you can identify which are the positive sunspot and which are the minus, like the plus sunspots and the minus sunspots. So this is the way, and you can also identify the flares because where because the sun is a is a play, playground of magnetic field. So the magnetic fields are the big boss there. So the particles follow their rules. So you can also probe coronal holes. You can also probe uh, CMEs, of course. You can also probe, probe solar flares sunspots and a lot of other things like spicules. There are lots of other things which you can probe via Zeeman effect because the fundamental okay. thing of Zeeman effect is magnetic field only. Yeah. Right. So from the Zeeman shift, so from the light, uh, how is it done? The, you measure the Zeeman shift and then in the, uh, then you from the Zeeman shift you get the estimate of B. Yes. So yeah, basically what you do is you have a magnetogram. There is something called magnetogram. So just like the corona graph I have shown. So there is something called magnetogram. So you first need to filter. You, 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 you just need to filter the photograph and using the magnetogram, uh, you can find out the spots where the strong magnetic fields. Of course, via Zeeman effect, you cannot find out the uh, minimal change of magnetic field, like the magnetic fluctuations you cannot find out. This is only because sun is very far away and the resolution is not that high. If you have a very high resolution Zeeman effect, like uh, magnetogram, you can obviously find out those things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Okay, as there is no question, so thank, uh, thank you, uh, Debesh, uh, for your nice presentation. Uh, let me move to our next speaker in this session, yes. uh, Mr. Orijit Panda. Uh, he is a research scholar from Raigons University. He will be talking on a non-canonical uh, study of the collapse of massive object in generalized uh, with the space time in the context of massive gravity's rainbow. Uh, so, Orijit, are you here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, am I audible? Okay. Yeah, you are audible. Start your presentation. Okay. okay. So is it visible? Yes, it is visible. Okay. Yes. Thank yes, you. Now it is full screen. Okay, start. Uh, thank and you. Your uh, time is fifteen minutes. Okay. 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 So um, thank you all the uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to present here. So basically, I was listening to all the lectures. Uh, so uh, my lectures is only based on uh, a hardcore theoretical aspect so i afraid uh, how many 
uh, get bored from my lectures i don't know so uh, so this is actually a theoretical project or theoretical work on uh, uh, with my uh, supervisors dr gautam manna and dr rabiul islam and the other co-authors are saibal rai and vibhas majumdar so the this is a non canonical study of the collapse of massive objects in generalized boido space time in the context of massive gravity rainbow so there are uh, so many new terms in the uh, title only so i am uh, coming to the terms one by one so what is rainbow gravity so we all know about the prism the light go passes through the prism and due to the velocity difference of velocities uh, the light uh, white light scattered in uh, different seven lights so same thing happens when light passes through the uh, any massive object the massive object experiences different types of gravity from when we go far from the center and different types of gravity experience uh, gives the light experience to to experience some different uh, phenomena and the pathway become bends and some uh, other cosmological event happened so there is a term that is called dual space relativity or dsr so that is uh, we know about the real special relativity and uh, the equation we have i have shown here in equation 1 this is just a deformed relation which we have studied in the graduation level we all study that e square equal to p square minus p square equal to m square we if we take the if we cut back the c, cut the c square term or c to the power 4 term or take the c equal to 1 the light velocity equal to 1 then we get the uh, energy relation dispersion relation e square minus p square equal to m square so in w special relativity the term has been modified by some function f square epsilon and g square epsilon as you can see in equation one so these are some choices of um, function that can be uh, chosen different for different cases uh, differently so this is actually a non-linear realization of relativity uh, in the momentum space okay so uh, actually this e in the bracket term that is in equation one this is actually a ratio of the uh, energy of the particle uh, and the energy of the energy of Planck energy so actually we are working here with Planck energy and we are trying to see particles of different metric uh, having different energies here and studying the uh, case where special uh, theory of relativity has been changed or deformed by the relation by equation one. So uh, also there is a term in gravitational collapse. What is gravitational collapse? That means uh, uh, we know about we already heard about black hole uh, from the uh, past lecturers. So gravitational collapse is nothing but the collapsing of an astronomical object, highly massive astronomical object due to the influence of its own gravity. And there are many things happen there. The pressure uh, of the um, uh, object can um, stop the gra gravitational collapse and uh, etc. etc. But the main thing is, is that the gravitational collapse may uh, end up to a black hole or a naked singularity. So we have already learned about black hole or everyone ever heard about black hole. where the uh, singularity is not uh, covered by any uh, horizon or the event horizon we know that um, in case of black hole there is a event horizon horizon but in case of naked singularity there is no event horizon so we can see the uh, fate of the light just until uh, it gets trapped into the singular point that is the center point r equal to zero point or the uh, radius part or the time part equal to zero so that uh, gives us some opportunity to communicate with far away observers in the universe observers mean uh, i am not about uh, not taking about talking about alien actually so observers mean anything that can uh, that that is a massive object which has been going through gravitational collapse so to study gravitational collapse there is a particular space time which is called boido space time that actually describes the uh, radiating Schwarzschild space time. Though we, you have uh, learned about uh, general theory of relativity, you know that Schwarzschild solution is one of the solution of the Einstein equation of special uh, general theory of relativity. So the special uh, the Schwarzschild solution also uh, has been modified by the famous Indian scientist Vaidya, and he gave some solution that uh, gives up gives up with the space time, which can use to uh, study the radiation 
of a uh, massive object or any black hole or uh, something like that so next uh, we have also also mentioned the non canonical way the non canonical study what is non canonical why we are talking about so much about non canonical so actually we have uh, if we consider the uh, previous uh, scenario of, of newton so newton uh, from newton the d'alembert principle again lagrange equation of motion everything we have done in the in the scenario that we we are actually dealing with the canonical uh, um, terms where the total energy has been taken uh, so from the lagrangian has been taken as t minus b but it is not uh, necessary that the lagrangian should be as the form of t minus b so there is a non canonical theory that non canonical theory does not predict the form of lagrangian but you can also all, always derive the uh, canonical term from the non canonical term so in this basis non canonical theory is the most more general theory which can uh, end into the canonical theory at particular conditions or you have uh, approached any particular field of um, study so k sense is one type of non canonical theory so this is a scalar field theory why k sense the k sense actually the the name as suggest k means kinetics and where we actually consider the kinetic energy term dominates with the potential energy term and we take the potential energy as a subdominant or submissive part and the k sense has a fine advantage as we know that the universe is um, in this case in the, in the in the present day the universe is expanding and we are living we are human beings as far we don't know any living things in any planet but why the why we are living in the in this planet at this time why we, we know the cosmic coincidence problem that the everything in this universe is so much accurate at so much precise that we can exist in the universe so why this is this happens so there is no answer uh, um, uh, also to the einstein so this problem was known as cosmic coincidence problem why this is uh, just this is a coincidence or there was a theater or there are something uh, we don't know so this problem actually uh, resolves by the KSN theory which actually is actually scalar field theory which describes that that the scalar field of the geometry actually uh, evolves such a way that the formation of stars formation of universe formation of uh, earth or sun or whatever we are seeing near us is due to the structure of the case in a sort of structure of the scalar field itself and the formation of the evolution of the scalar field itself and in the case sense we uh, the action of the scalar field has been described in equation 2 we know the physics can be studied by through the through the action principle and minimizing the action this is the basic problems of basics the solution of the of any problem in physics so this the action for case in particular has been modified by equation 2 and the equation of motion of the scalar field uh, becomes like this which is uh, not likely the in newton's equation of motion this is much more complicated by the four dimensional matrix mu nu has the term 0 1 2 3 that is there is 0 is time coordinate 1 2 3 are, three are space coordinate so basically we are talking about the equation number five where we see that that g mu nu bar is actually actually equal to some term in multiplied by small g mu nu this small g mu nu actually was given by einstein in special uh, general zero relativity but in case in, in scalar field we actually modified the term there that is why we called this is effective emergent metric the metric always ex uh, explain the universe in the in uh, in uh, einstein's way the usual metric but this matrix has been modified by the presence of the scalar field by the presence of the non-canonical lagrangian we will come the non-canonical lagrangian the form of non-canonical lagrangian uh, one example of that non canonical Lagrangian is the DBI type Lagrangian, that is Dirac Born infield Lagrangian. This is one type of non canonical Lagrangian. And if we take the Lagrangian of this type, then the effective emergent matrix, which I have shown in the question 5, becomes simplified simply G mu nu equal to this G mu nu minus some correction term. So this is the Einstein G mu nu, that is the uh, special theory of relativity de depicts. And this G mu nu has been modified by the uh, scalar field actually. Now, the dispersion relation we are talking about earlier, the e square minus f square, this is a function, and this function can be chosen as this way, g epsilon and f epsilon. This epsilon is just the ratio of the energy of the particle and the energy of Planck, Planck energy. So we are starting in the Planck energy. What is massive gravity? Massive gravity, actually, we study massive gravity to start study massive gravity. We change the action by introducing a massive term in the 
action this is the geometry part of the universe or, or the or our study this is the matter part of our study and this is the massive term which contributes the matter part or the mass part in the in rough way the mass part not actually mass part but you can think about that think like that this is the mass of the object that we are talking about and the field equation of the massive gravity becomes like equation 14 this is simply uh, um, crucial cal just algebraic calculation and geometrical calculation uh, so i am not going about the calculation so as i as have I said earlier that this is this may become seems to you some boring topic because this is particularly uh, hardcore theoretical so there is a barotropic relation that is our uh, concern p equal to kappa rho so there is p p is the pressure of the universe or the universe matter of the universe total matter of the universe and the rho is the energy density of the universe and we relate these two by the term kappa t mu nu is the source of the matter that can be considered as the radiation part and the matter part there are many much unknown things in our universe we know as we uh, have already known that at, uh, only 4% of the universe has been known but the 96% of the universe is unknown to us that is consist of dark energy and dark matter and this is the matter part this is the um, known matter part and and unknown matter part and this is the energy radiation matter part so using these types of theory we can actually um, calculate or study the um, fate of the gravitational collapse uh, what will be a fate of a gravitational collapse is that a black hole or is that a naked singularity so this is some mathematical calculation where the action has been the metric has been taken by modified by the uh, energy dispersion relation uh, this is dt square dv square means actually the time coordinate and this is a cross term that is a dt dr term and this is the other uh, coordinate that is theta and phi term and the, we have modified this term by f square by a f, f epsilon g epsilon this is the massive term mass mass term and uh, the choice of f, f1 and f2 mm, sorry to interrupt or is it you have yeah. another two minute to wrap up your presentation okay 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 thank you so in case of uh, non-canonical theory the the action has been modified by this extra term phi v square that is the uh, case in part this was the actual term this is the previous uh, slide there is no phi v square and we introduced a phi v square term that is the case in part and using this metric we developed a theory where we study that uh, this is the geometric and matter um, the um, tensor tensorial calculation calculation we i am not going about uh, in, in into it so this is the actual uh, matter part this matter part becomes the this uh, changed matter part that was we have shown earlier the matter source term that is the matter part this is the radiation part and the matter part has been changed in our case this uh, rho and p is not the same this density has been changed this pressure has been changed and using this uh, matter parts these are exp uh, expressed here particularly we actually get the null geodesic where null geodesic actually express the um, where the time coordinate is faster than the space coordinate and if the time coordinate is faster than the space coordinate, space coordinate then we get the naked singularity so this is the chi chi means dvdr that means chi is, is if chi is uh, greater than zero that means dv is greater than d here that means time coordinate is greater than radio, uh, distance coordinate so that means it is a um, the time like geodesic uh, type type of thing so this is the limiting value limiting value means the um, the core part that is when r tends to zero and t tends to zero that is the central part we are studying here and this becomes this equation equation number 40 this is our ultimate result and when we uh, plot this result uh, with various parameter we see that the k part that is the chi part chi part is always above the zero value that means it is a positive value that is the time coordinate is advanced and that is why we can say that naked singularity can be formed due to some the some uh, particular choice of mass function particular choice of uh, constant particular choice of alpha or particular choice of the uh, scalar field we have talking about so this is our main finding we can say that if is the mass part is larger than the uh, chi part is uh, becomes low and the formation of naked singularity becomes low so that is uh, that is our finding that the all in all cases this is k this is omega this is the when this is zero this means the pressure less dust regime uh, when this is minus one or minus half this is our present universe this is uh, minus one to corresponds to the present universe data so there is also form chances of forming of naked singularity though i should mention that the naked singularity has not been found by 
our any 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 of our observe observer or any of our telescopes so far so uh, that is uh, my work with my uh, co-workers and i would like to appreciate my supervisor dr rabiul islam and dr gautam manna from uh, raiganj university and pk college kantai uh, thank you all okay nice presentation uh, so any questions from the audience uh, anisotropy related to that Uh, so, uh, as Einstein was uh, said earlier, that the light uh, experiences different uh, phenomena due to the gravitational thing. That is, the light is not uh, light. Or light can bend towards yeah. gravitational object, and that was thing. So, if the gravitational object has different gravity around it, and actually the gravity changes so anomalously uh, in uh, um, uh, around a gravitational object, the light can. Experienced through different types of gravity, and so they changes they so no, different nature. I just nature. want to know: is there any some specific parameter on which this gravity changes inside the mass, particularly? What you are doing actually? Uh, so actually, we are asking about the if the light experiences something particular in uh, gravitating object, right? For gravity, for gravity, uh, gravity. higher gravity in higher gravity the light is there, there is there some is... gradient of gravity inside or something i just want to know <laughs> no that is uh, is there is a limit that the light can um, experience some bending you can um, uh, actually th that is the part of the gravitational lensing there is a chapter called uh, there is a topic called gravitational lensing where we study the how the light actually affected by the gravitating object when light passes through sun or light passes through earth they doesn't feel the same way right earth is so small the, its gravity is more small but the sun has bit larger gravity so they should different experience they should experience different gravity so that is the uh, gravitational lensing part but i am actually working in the uh, gravitating object whose gravitation is so much uh, high that light cannot pass through it that is the black hole uh, that the concept of black hole right the concept of black hole says that light cannot pass through it so i have uh, um, uh, go in, into the farthest limit or the extreme limit so you are talking stress, about the black hole the lights in the black hole masses yeah actually we are talking about singularity black hole is one type of singularity that is covered by event horizon right and we are starting with naked singularity which is which was not covered by event horizon So basically, yes, we are um, studying black hole or like black hole things, singularity things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So. Okay. So if uh, there is in there is no other question, so let me go thank uh, speaker Mr. Orijit Panda and um, my next speaker in this session is Dr. Uh, Nirman Chakraborty. He is a postdoctoral fellow of Weizmann Institute of Science, and he will be talking on uh, can magnetic field influence. chemi resistive sensing case of nitric oxide detection by v dope neo nano clusters uh, over to you dr chakraborty uh, am i audible yes you are audible yes and uh, is the screen the screen uh, is visible? also yes screen is the screen is also visible yes okay so i shall start okay so um, good afternoon to everyone um i would first of all thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work the title of my today's presentation is uh, can magnetic field influence chemiresistive sensing case of nitric oxide detection by vanadium doped nickel oxide nano clusters so to begin with uh in the background 
uh, nanomaterials have, uh, you know, like uh, they have um, consumed a wide spectrum of uh, applications in the field of material science, particularly because of the unique properties that materials show in the nanoscale. So we are, I'm specifically talking about the regime that is one to thousand nanometers, where we have all sorts of unique properties shown by these materials. Uh, because of mainly the quantum confinement effect and uh, the electron-electron correlation functions that come into play, because of which the features that are usually seen in the macro or the bulk scale are different in the nanoscale. As a result of this, nanomaterials uh, have found applications in a large number of fields, starting from the gas sensors to solar cells to LEDs and eventually into uh, you know like the miniature circuits quantum computing and so on so i shall be concentrating today on one particular type of materials that is chemiresistive gas sensing materials and the phenomena of chemiresistive sensing and uh, to give a brief uh, idea of what chemiresistive sensing is, so actually it's a phenomena where a material, usually a wide band gap semiconductor, when exposed to air, it uh, captures oxygen or oxygen uh, molecules from the environment, uh, sit on the surface via the dangling bonds by chemisorption, and oxygen being more electronegative pulls electrons from the system. The system records a resistance. Now, when some external analyte uh, interacts with the surface oxygen layer as a result of the redox reaction on the surface, the electrons that were actually captured by this oxygen layer are released into system or are withdrawn, depending it's a reducing or an oxidizing uh, reaction. So accordingly, we have a change in the sample's bulk resistance and we measure the uh, response of the sample. So it initially starts from the surface and the bulk is also involved in it. Now, Transition metal oxides are one of the major, uh, you can say, um, type of materials which are used for chemistry sensing, particularly because of their wide band gap and also uh, they are also very uh, easily, uh, you know, they can be synthesized and so on. Now, one feature of this kind of uh, transition metal oxide is their unfilled d orbitals, which gives this class of materials uh, different magnetic properties ferromagnetism, uh, antiferromagnetism, and so on. So there have been a lot of studies that have shown how the different aspects of nanostructures, basically transition metal oxides, like the particle size, surface area, morphology, and porosity, they affect the chemiresistive sensing, which is a surface phenomena. But these materials, which have these unique magnetic properties, uh, very little study has been done till date to show if their magnetic, bulk magnetic behavior can affect their surface phenomena. That is the chemistry sensing in our case. So in this work, what I wanted, or you can say we wanted to focus on is that if there is any correlation between the bulk magnetic field of transition metal oxide systems uh, and their uh, chemistry uh, response that is mediated to the surface. So this picture I just gave as a representative to show that how the bulk magnetism occurs. So actually, in, a, in this kind of materials or in any kind of magnetic materials, the, uh, um, uh, the, it is consists of domains with each domain has a particular orientation which is determined by the population of its spins and their preferred orientation. So based on the magnetic field that we apply, either they orient in one particular direction and they have for eminent magnetization, accordingly we can call it as a ferromagnet, and and based on the amount of orientation in a particular direction, we can have other kind of magnets as well. So based on all these things in mind, we went forward towards a practical system to check if this correlation really exists. So we chose a very standard uh, system that is nickel oxide, which is a p-type anti-ferromagnetic wide band gap semiconductor transition metal oxide. And we doped it with vanadium because pure metal oxides have very poor selectivity towards a certain gas as a sensor. And vanadium has multiple oxidation states in the doped form. So we wanted to have as much as, uh, you know, like electronic structure uh, modulation because of this doping. And the second reason is that from our previous studies, we found that if we dope a material with a metal atom, which is having a smaller ionic radius, it leads to a reduction in the initial volume 
that makes the surface uh, density of active sites. Uh, there is an increase in the surface density of active sites, which improves their surface performance. So for that purpose, we did vanadium doping in our nickel oxide system. So we had different compositions of vanadium and nickel oxide. And we found that as a result of the vanadium doping, the initial volume of the doped samples, which we have termed as NIV3, NIV4, and NIV5 for these three different compositions, the initial volume reduces by nearly one angstrom and angstrom cube. And from our previous uh, calculations, we have shown that um, because of this decrease in the initial volume, uh, the number of surface active sites increases by nearly 10 to the power 19 per millimeter cube of the sample. So this definitely makes the doped samples uh, more surface active compared to the pure one. So now we performed chemistry sensing experiments with our pure and doped systems. We found that while the pure system has a pore sensing response of 5% towards 1 ppm nitric oxide, which is a paramagnetic uh, species, our sample is most responsive towards nitric oxide, which is a paramagnetic gas. The doped samples have nearly four times greater sensing response, out of which one particular composition, that is NIV4, has a 98% sensing response, which is nearly 3 to uh, 3.2 to 3.4 times more sensing or sensitive than NIV3 and NIV5. So these are the plots that show the sensing response of the pure and the doped samples. Now, what we thought that if the bulk magnetic property of the material could be tuned by using external magnetic field, if it is affecting the sensing performance or not. So we found that yes, particularly in the sample NIV4, the sensing response increases by nearly 30% on applying the external magnetic field. Also, the response and recovery are very quick in this sample. In other samples, the response definitely increases, but the response and recovery are much slower. And if we increase the magnetic field, we find that the sensing response increases. Now, the question is that how it is happening? So for the first, for, first of all, because it's a surface mediated phenomena, uh, okay, and one uh, basic, uh, you know, like ground based on which we chose our compositions was that that all the samples have similar particle size, uh, morphology, porosity, and uh, surface area, because in that case we can actually compare what is the effect of the surface electronic structure and the bulk magnetism. So other factors are kept similar. So we already, uh, for the, uh, you know, for uh, we had a very a planned way of getting this nanocluster architecture so as to have uh, a greater surface area so that they can actually interact more with the incoming gases and we have a high BT surface area of about 70 meter square per gram. So now if we look at the surface uh, electronic structure analysis from extra photoelectron uh, spectroscopy, we find that nickel exists in 2 plus and 3 plus state and after doping vanadium exists simultaneously as 3, 4 and 5. And if we calculate the amount of net surface charge imbalance per formula unit for all the samples, we find that there is an excess surface positive charge, which is minimum in case of the NIV4 composition, which is 1.2 to 1.4 times less than the other doped samples. So this means that this sample has, an, uh, has the deficiency, which is very uh, the excess positive charge, which is less than this. Now, nickel uh, nitric oxide is typically an oxidizing gas and nickel oxide is a p-type semiconductor. However, questions arise that if vanadium doping changes its electronic uh, behavior. So for this, what we did, we obtained the uh, transport property measurements. We did the Hall effect studies, and we found that even after vanadium doping, our sample continues to be a p-type material. So then we uh, were confirmed that nitric oxide over here has an oxidizing nature. And as an interaction with the surface, it withdraws electrons from the material. Now, the composition NIV4 has less excess surface positive charge. So for a p-type semiconductor, this material will make it more easier for the nitric oxide to pull electrons from the system. And therefore, as electrons are withdrawn from the p-type system, the number of holes increases, and this causes a greater change in the sample's resistance as compared to the other sample, that is NIV3 and NIV5. However, the question arises is that the ratio uh, doesn't match. It is definitely more than that of NIV3 and NIV5. So some other factor must come into play. And then we perform the magnetic measurements of the samples. And to our surprise, nickel oxide is typically antiferromagnetic. But 
when we did the magnetism experiments, we found that our samples are actually soft ferromagnets. Soft in the terms that they have less magnetic uh, moment or this remnant magnetic moment per unit mass as compared to strong ferromagnets like Fe304. And if we compare the different magnetic moments of our sample, we find that for NIV4, the magnetic moment is, the remnant magnetic moment is least, which is actually two times less than the, the two different dope samples. So if we now go into a comparison of how this has an effect on the surface behavior. So NIP4 has a very flexible uh, domain structure. First of all, it's a soft ferromagnet. And secondly, it has this lower remnant magnetic moment as compared to the other dope compositions as well. So when we apply an external magnetic field to this sample, the domains orient in such a way that they attract more and more nitric oxide, which is a paramagnetic species, towards it and causes maximum effective interaction. And when we remove the magnetic field, since they are very flexible, they quickly reorient themselves into their original position and the surface desorption occurs and the system gets back to its original system, which is not the case in case of NIV3 and NIV5, which first of all has uh, a greater remnant magnetic moment. So because of this, Although it attracts more number of nitric oxide molecules, but first of all, there is a problem of the mutual repulsion between the hugely crowded surface full of nitric oxide molecules because of which the effective interaction gets hampered. And secondly, because the domains are not flexible, so even after the desorption occurs, this system retains its magnetism and therefore the surface gets, uh, you can say, overcrowded and the recovery is definitely less. So, even if it's a uh, soft ferromagnet, the amount of softness matters. So, mm. over so here, sorry to inter answer. interrupt you. Actually, uh, you have to wrap up within two or three minutes. Yes, okay. yes, yes. I have just, it's just okay. uh, oh, definitely, last definitely. of the slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, from this, we come to, and so these are the mechanisms, and the, so this is the mechanism how the whole process occurs. And from here, we can actually come to a very uh, uh, conclusion that the bulk magnetic field uh, is actually being affected and it, as a result of which the, surf, the orientation of domains uh, are changed in such a way that the surface property uh, is also affected. And particularly if the target gas is a paramagnetic species like nitric oxide or a nitrous oxide, then this phenomena can be more prevalent. So for the uh, so this is one of the very uh, few studies that has been done which shows that yes magnetic property of materials affect the surface behavior of this kind of uh, things and this also opens a way for uh, you know effective room temperature um, chemistry nitric oxide sensors so if we look at literature our sample has a very high response of 98 percent at room temperature towards a very small P uh, concentration of gas that is basically 1 ppm. And uh, cross sensitivity with nitrous oxide, NO2, is definitely less because nitric oxide has a smaller, so the pores of this material was designed in such a way that it allows only nitric oxide, so which is a, having a particular polar surface area into it and not other molecules as such. So here I come to the end of this uh, presentation for today. So I want to thank the following people. First, first uh, my institute, CSS Central Class, and presently the Weizmann Institute of Science, my PhD supervisor, Dr. Shostik Mondo, and all my collaborators for their support. So thank you all. OK, so any questions uh, from the speaker? If not, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, for nice presentation. Thank uh, you, so, uh, Nirman. Oh yeah, yeah. Nirman, how are you? I am no host. Yes, it's nice to see you. Yes, ma'am. I'm fine. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> very, very good. Yes, yes. You are doing very nice work. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. All the best. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. My student at Jadavpur University. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, so let me um, uh, move to another speaker. Next speaker of this session, Mr. Shomo Dev Ghosh. Uh, he is a research scholar of Adamas University. He will be talking on optical property modification with Mg doping in uh, Zn one minus x MgXO nanoparticles prepared by weight chemical synthesis technique. Over to you, so Shomo Dev. Yes, I am. Shomo Dev, you are here. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Start sharing your screen, yes. I think it is uh, sharing. Is it yeah, there? screen is there. Um, uh, can you make it full screen? Yeah. Uh, you can do it from slideshow, I think. Yes, from current slide. I don't know. Excellent. Or press F5. Slide show, then from current slide. From current slide, from beginning also. Okay. Yes, yes, it is now full screen. Start, please start. Your time is 15 minutes. Okay, 12 plus 3. Okay. Again, what is Mexican man. They have some problem. Actually, we can see your screen properly. Okay, ma'am. Hmm. At first, I uh, am thankful to the Atomas University and YPM Managing Group to, to give me the opportunity to express my work. Myself, Sohumodev Bhos, the research scholar, Department of Physics, Atomas University, and also faculty member. Oh. Now I am presenting the, the optical property modification with MG doping in JDNO nanoparticle prepared by weight chemical synthesis method, actually by probe specification method. Next. This is my summary of the presentation. At first, I introduce my work. In, case, in this presentation, I mainly present the, to JDNO nanoparticle and mg dome properties of JDNO nanoparticle and mg dome JDNO nanoparticle. After that, I will present the objective of, and importance of my present work, and then I express the synthesis technique. We actually we go through the synthesis thing, uh, weight chemical synthesis technique of mg dope jeteno nanoparticle. After that, I will express the characterization techniques and then conclusion and discussion. That was interaction. J um, actually, jeteno is the hexagonal structure, rurujite structure, and this it belongs in this space group. Jeteno is very good emitter with direct band gap, and its band gap is near about 3.3 to 3.4 electron volt, and it has dark large excitation energy near about 60 milli electron volt at room temperature it generally used in various optoelectric device light uh, like light emitting diode solar cell laser etc and jeteno nanoparticle is full of defects uh, full of defects different type of defects like oxygen vacancy interstitial defects etc and now they have some app, um, uh, the applications of jeteno nanoparticle jeteno nanoparticle can use at laser system at bioimaging uh, at led solar cell uv detector biosensing it is 
it can use as catalyst the textile industry energy storage device and antibacterial device and also drug delivery system now as for synthesis we prepare jeno nano um, mg group jeno nano particle in our lab we take um, uh, acetate salt of zinc of uh, zinc and um, acetate salt of magnesium and we um, make solution in methanol medium uh, after that uh, in an, uh, another bigger we made solution of naoh after that in, in sonication condition we drop oh at naoh solution with the zinc salt zinc and magnesium sol solution and we sonicate it 30 minutes after that we leave it for precipitation one day finally when precipitation are completed we collect it by centrifuging so 7000 uh, 7, rpm we centrifuging in 7000 uh, rpm then we cleaning and washing we wash it two time by uh, double distilled water and one time by uh, methanol after that we collect jeno mg of jeno nanoparticle and we heating it three hour at 300 degree and differently heating it three hour at 500 degree centigrade after that we make characterization like xrd tem ftir uv raman spectra etc now it is the xrd diagram of 500 degree annealed mg dope jeno nanoparticle here we here we saw the different um, uh, doping percentage at first the blue line is jeno nanoparticle pure jeno nanoparticle and the, this is the 1% mg dope jeno nanoparticle this is 3% mg dope jeno nanoparticle and this is the 5% mg dope jeno nanoparticle we, we notice that the most uh, intense peak is 101 peak so we can conclude that the most of the particle are oriented in that particular plane and it is the XRD diagram of jeno um, nanoparticle here um, these three graph are 300 degree annealed um, mg of jeno nanoparticle and these are the 500 degree annealed jeno nanoparticle we notice that the peak are more sharper when we when we increase the annealing temperature this is the formula we calculate the grain size of jeno nanoparticle here we notice that the ftir value are increasing when the annealing temperature are decreasing that means when we increase the temperature they are um, they get binding energy more binding energy and the crystal growth have been occurred this is the value of c and this is the value of a and this is the volume of the part, uh, particle now this is the uh, team diagram of jeno nano nanoparticle in zero jeno nanoparticle here we saw that maximum uh, particle are in spherical shape and when we increase the doping concentration the particle size are also increased and this is the ftir diagram for mg dope jeno nanoparticle here first three, three diagram is one percent mg dope three percent mg dope per 300 degree annual and this is the uh, three percent mg dope at 500 degree annual so here from uh, ftir diagram we get some absorption uh, peak absorption spectrum here the uh, 300 to 375 uh, 350 um, centimeter inverse there this peak for oh bonding oh jdno jdno group 
and this peak is for um, CH bond and this is the final peak for JDN uh, JDN um, JDN and O bonding we made the we complete the UV study of JDNO nanoparticle here we clearly see that when, when the doping concentration had increased the band um, gap each band gap energy or increase we notice that the band gap energy of one percent mg of jeno nanoparticle is near about 3.3 electron volt and for five percent it increased 3.4 and more than 3.4 electron volt and we also notice that the wavelength and we also know that the absorption speed also increased with the doping concentration this is the raman spectra of jeno nanoparticle we notice that the defect peak or the broad peak are uh, at in between 500 to 600 centimeter inverse and the broad peak are uh, in a uh, decrease with increasing width of uh, mg concentration this we analyze the this broad peak here the first one this peak a one peak is due to zinc interstitial vacancy and for the for the second peak is for oxygen vacancies and we see that when the when the doping concentration are increased then the these um, defects are uh, are not found now conclusion we we prepared highly crystalline jdno and mg of jdno nanoparticle by using co precipitation method we we calculate the grain size by from the uh, xrd and from tem diagram we calculate the average grain size and also we found that the uh, the shape of the jdno nanoparticle is average average particle are in uh, spherical shape from uv study we notice that the band gap is increased with dropping concentration and from the ramon spectra we get to broad peak in between 500 to 600 centimeter inverse but um, when we um, increase the doping concentration then we can't we are not found the these uh, defects now i, uh, I am especially thankful for from adamas university for give me the research opportunity and i also thankful for my supervisor dr sarup kumar niyogi and i also acknowledge calcutta university and crnn for giving me to using their lab facility and i also thankful dr rupam sen associate professor hod chemistry adamas university for provide me his lab facility to synthesize this particle and i also thankful in physics department sirukano bisa university ulia for um, supporting thank you okay okay uh, so any question uh, from shomodev so if not uh, actually uh, our next speaker uh, in this session uh, is uh, not here with us uh, due to some medical emergency miss shongita dash uh, so here uh, we actually come to the closure of this session uh, so over to you dr bhattacharya thank you dr das thank you dr vishesh for conduct hosting this session so nicely so we are once again meeting at quarter past 2 with the next session. Thank you all participants for joining with us and we will meet once again, at a, as I have said, at quarter past two. 
uh, with the talk from Professor Devnarayan Jana. So see you all there.